Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Josh, great to see you again. It's been, uh, I don't know, I was trying to think about this the other day. Has it, it was about three years ago, I think was the last time we saw each other in person at that, uh, some sort of conference in New York, um, a cancer metabolism conference, I think, right? Oh yeah, the uh, New York Academy of Sciences, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, and we somehow wound up at some kind of mediocre bar in Brooklyn and it might have been the dorkiest concentration of people talking about autophagy and metabolomics and all sorts of things there was. Oh yeah, yeah, that was actually the AACR Brooklyn conference, that's true. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's really funny, just recently I've interviewed a few of our classmates from med school, Max Dean and Carl Deseroth, um, and I think Carl and I were reminiscing about how you, me, and Carl all started our surgical rotation together in the same day. And I, I, I it, it's almost 25 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday when we were all sitting in the room practicing sewing with our big goofy knots and things like that before we all got divided up into our surgical rotations. Do you do you remember that? I, I definitely remember you. I really do not remember Carl from those days, but I certainly remember you practicing a lot while I looked and said, oh, I guess that's what you're supposed to be doing if you want to become a surgeon. Uh, the thing I remember most clearly is being in surgery with you. And it was like the very end of surgery rotation and uh, finally being given the bovie <laughs> and immediately making a mistake. And, uh, you know, then I got the nice lecture, you know, we're happy to pass you on this rotation as long as you promise never to use, you know, a knife or bovie again. So, <laughs> so um, remind me, whose lab did you do your PhD in? I did my PhD with Hardin McConnell, uh, one of the great physical chemists, uh, together with Mark Davis, the uh, immunologist. And so t tell, tell me and tell the listeners a little bit about what project you worked on for your thesis. Uh, my thesis was about the physical chemistry of T cell activation. And so uh, at that point in time, people had discovered that different antigens could activate T cells differentially. And so I was really interested in how that happened. And so I studied the process of antigens turning into peptides that could bind to MHC and then how the kinetics of the interaction between the peptide antigen and the major histic compatibility complex protein MHC, um, and then the interaction of that complex with the T cell receptor determined whether people have productive or failed immune responses with the hopes you could then manipulate those processes to promote better vaccination or um, disease clearance and also to potentially treat autoimmunity. And did you also have an interest at all in cancer? Because of course, this would be one of the hallmarks of how immunotherapy would be effective in uh, eradicating cancer. You know, uh, shows how bad a prognosticator I am. At that point, I really felt that like immunological approaches to cancer didn't hold that much promise. And so I was really more focused on uh, infectious disease and autoimmunity. Uh, so shows you what I know. It's wonderful to see that the world has turned out to be a lot better than I, I dreamed it would be on that dimension. No, but it's such an interesting topic. Um, I had Steve Rosenberg on the podcast last year and it was just a, it was a beautiful and fun recap of how the immune system works in general, but we were talking about it obviously through the lens of cancer. And I think the part that will forever, um, humble anyone who tries to think about how amazing the system is is that these things have to be, you know, nine to 11 amino acids long. I mean, the peptides have to be just the right size to be presented and then to be recognized. And that just doesn't seem to leave a lot of margin for error. I mean, it is really a, a tuned system. Do you have a sense of why evolution ended up with such a narrow fragment of peptides that were recognizable uh, as opposed to a broader range or as opposed to just a range that's different? Like why wasn't it two to three or 150 to 160 amino acids? Like, is there a chemical reason? Because you're a, because of your background in chemistry, I feel like you'd be more equipped to offer a teleologic explanation for this. Yeah, I mean, I do have an intuitive sense on this that, you know, uh, our bodies work on the scale of, you know, 
billions of immune cells and billions of immune receptors that are made through recombination. And that naturally pairs with billions of antigens. And so you just think about this number nine and you think about the number of amino acids, right? There are 20 amino acids. So you're talking about 20 to the ninth power of presentable peptide antigens. And so these things are all tuned to be on the same scale, this kind of scale of billions. Tens of billions in that case, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if you did it, if it, if it was like a three peptide, it's, it's really a small number, actually. There's not enough information there yeah. to, you know, selectively respond to a virus, you know, uh, or a, a bacteria. And if it was 25 peptides, it, it's too much. It's, there's too much information there. There's extra information anyway. And this system, I think, was built to work on minimal or, or just the right amount of information. Yeah, that's super interesting. So at what point during either your PhD or the end of medical school where we met up in the, in the clinical mm -hmm. portion, did you make the decision that you wanted to be a full-time scientist as opposed to a physician scientist? You know, I uh, applied to do an uh, internship knowing that I really loved research, but um, I guess I decided as I did more and more medicine that medicine is such a noble profession, but it involves a lot of doing the same thing right over and over again, uh, a lot of following the standard of care, even for the most creative physicians, and that ultimately, like my passion is to come in and try to do something different uh, every day, to think differently than people ever have before, and so that's what really led me to research. I, I love the patient interaction part of medicine. It was the uh, doing things right part that was challenging for me sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I think um, those of us that, that chose the more medical side of things can also speak to the frustration of how uh, creativity can often be stifled in, in medicine. And that's in large part for good reason, but I think it comes at a cost as well. Uh, and I, I'm sure, I think I'm sure on this podcast, I've told stories about how frustrating that was uh, in surgery, at least surgery, probably more so than most other uh, disciplines uh, tends to uh, sometimes at least frown upon creativity and novel approaches to problem solving. Um, now, if, if I remember correctly, before you joined the faculty at Princeton, where you are now, you went into industry straight from medical school. Is that, am I getting my facts right? Yeah. So, um, I, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work with one of the great early biotech entrepreneurs, Alex Zaffaroni. And so, uh, he and I started a company, uh, when I was straight out of medical school that was focused on fast drug delivery. So what could you do by being able to deliver medications non-invasively on the time scale of giving an IV push in the hospital? And so uh, we did that through uh, inhalation of small molecules, kind of building on the concept, obviously, that if you smoke something like a cigarette, you get incredibly rapid access to the systemic circulation. And so uh, we built that company, uh, Lexa Pharmaceuticals, uh, still exists, has one FDA approved drug. So that was, that was my first job. What, uh, what, drugs did you, what drugs were you targeting with that? You know, our initial focus was migraine. Uh, unfortunately, we never found the drug that had the perfect combination of safety with rapid delivery and efficacy for migraine. The drug that ultimately got approved was for acute agitation. And so uh, there's a set of it, hypnotic for acute agitation. And uh, I say it's really wonderful for the patients who get it. They come in, in the ER. It's something people don't always know about agitated patients. It's like they're agitated, they're frustrated, but they also want to stop being agitated. They don't want to act like that. And so they're very eager to, in most cases, to take a puff of something and calm down in a couple of minutes. It's, uh, it's wonderful for them. So this is kind of an unusual path, right? I, I'm guessing that most people who experience that type of success that you had would want to keep doing it over and over again. I mean, hence the term serial entrepreneur. What made you decide to take this lateral step to go into academics, which would have made a lot more sense if you'd done it coming straight out of your PhD? 
You know, I think I was lucky to get the chance to go straight from that job into a you know, faculty position at Princeton. That's a rare opportunity to have. Because you didn't do a postdoc in there and unless they considered your industry as sort of a grandfathered postdoc. Yeah, it was a very, very weird version of a postdoc. And um, it, it united me with my uh, wonderful wife and uh, at Princeton on the faculty here and um, turned out well. So you show up at Princeton and they put you on a tenure track position, which means they're giving you the types of resources to now start solving whatever problem you want. What was the first problem that you said, I want to build a lab around? You know, one thing that I learned actually doing Alexa was uh, about drugs because we studied every medication in the pharmacopoeia for whether it could be a candidate for rapid delivery. Could you make a, a benefit by delivering it rapidly? And one thing I noticed is that so many of the most important medications work via metabolism. And then starting out my lab, I realized that there were relatively few labs looking at metabolism broadly compared to other you know, really important areas of science like immunology or uh, cancer or neuroscience. And so I started my lab with a really simple question. Could we measure the classic metabolites that you read about in a biochemistry textbook in one shot quantitatively? And so that was uh, the starting point for my lab. And I guess the second question that we always had in our mind is can we measure the activities of those metabolic pathways? So how fast are those metabolites flowing? Where are they coming from and where are they going? I had lunch or dinner actually with one of our mutual friends, Navdeep Chandel, uh, who's also a previous guest on the podcast three or four years ago, uh, maybe a week ago. And he was here in Austin for uh, a talk. And we were talking about how in the late 90s, he said, and he was obviously studying metabolism. He said, if you were to rank me, meaning Nav was ranking himself, right? If he said, you were to rank me and my work just across the spectrum of the stuff scientists were doing, he said, I'm bottom 10 percentile. You know, I mean, nobody found metabolism interesting. It was, this was sort of the, uh, I forget the term he used, but like this was basically the corner where the the, the kids went that nobody wanted to play with. You know, if you weren't doing genomics, if you weren't doing this other sexy stuff, immunology, you were you were really an uninteresting person. But he just found it interesting. And of course, today, as we're going to discover, this is where the action is. So, you know, Nav was talking about that in the 90s. We're now in the early 2000s. Was it still a little bit of that stigma that Nav described that he was kind of under where he was like a totally underperforming, you know, loser in his own words? Or was that transition already starting to happen where people saw, wait a minute, there's something going on here? <laughs> you know, Nav is so funny. And you know, I don't think anyone who's ever met Nav thinks he's a loser. I'll, I'll say that right <laughs> off the bat first. Yeah. So, um, you know, but uh, I, I will say that, you know, metabolism as an area was definitely out of favor. And it was a really strange thing because you had the academic current that metabolism was a solved problem, right? Krebs was, you know, the culmination uh, of metabolism research at the same time that metabolic syndrome was becoming worse and worse and worse in the population. And I would say when I started, it was still not a real popular topic, metabolism, but I think um, two things were beginning to shift. One is the fact that people realized that, you know, genomics as a standalone was not going to solve health problems, uh, that it was really going to have to be um, supplemented by other technologies that looked at biochemistry broadly. And metabolomics proved to be one of those that I think has been enduring, will be enduring. And the second is that, you know, the metabolic syndrome epidemic just kept becoming more and more obvious. Yeah, so this is kind of where your training as a physician becomes relevant because perhaps more so than somebody who didn't spend four years also doing medical school, you saw the clinical problem that was sort of kicking you in the face, even if it wasn't top of mind to a scientist. 
Yeah, I, I think it's really true. You know, I just benefited so much from the breadth of biology uh, and medicine that you learn in medical school. And I mean, it allowed me to start my lab working on bacteria, which I had never worked on at all as a PhD student because, you know, you learn bacteriology is one of the things in, in medical school. And that was like the perfect starting point for building these technologies with a view all the way to metabolic syndrome and ischemia reperfusion injury, right? These huge medical problems, but I really wanted to start somewhere tractable where we could get, you know, firm proof of concept. So for somebody listening to this, which let's assume that they have a greater attention span than somebody you're going to walk into at a cocktail party, but obviously not necessarily the, the depth of understanding of everything we're about to go into. How would you explain metabolism to that person? Uh, metabolism is the process that converts the food we eat into usable energy and the building blocks our body needs to grow or regenerate itself as well as waste along the way. And so now how do you layer on the omic piece of that, which is really what we're starting to talk about. When people hear the word genomics, they sort of understand what that means. But I think when people hear the term metabolomics, it becomes a little harder to understand. So how would you now layer in that in, 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 in the context of everything that you're now beginning in your lab? Yeah, so, you know, the bulk of activity in metabolism that makes most of our usable energy uh, involves something like uh, 100 metabolites. And so the first thing we really wanted to be able to do was measure those 100 metabolites really well. So tell, tell people some examples of those, Josh, because I mean, I think we take it for granted, but like glucose would be an example of a metabolite. What are some other metabolites that are important to understand if you're trying to study this system? Yeah, so um, all the amino acids are other fundamental inputs that we get from the diet, like glutamine is a great example that's a very important circulating nutrient. Uh, other things that come in you know, from the diet, if you have vinegar, you have acetate, or else your microbiome can uh, make acetate that goes in the body. Fats are obviously important input metabolites. And, and then there's sets of intermediary uh, metabolites. Uh, these are things that are like glycolytic intermediates that people may have heard about in biochemistry. Fructose bisphosphate is a famous one of those. Uh, pyruvate, uh, lactate that a lot of people hear about from uh, exercise. Uh, members of the Krebs cycle like citrate uh, is a famous one that exists in our circulation, obviously in citrus fruits. Uh, so these are classic examples of metabolites. And then there are the kind of more effector or energy holding metabolites like ATP, NADH, NADPH. Got it. So I kind of interrupted you there, but you were kind of explaining how first you begin with sort of this survey of all of these metabolites. Yeah, so we, we want to be able to measure all of these. These are kind of the core components of metabolomics. And part of the, the beauty of metabolism as a system is that uh, with some modest variation, there's almost a singular solution on earth to how metabolism works. And so when we learn to measure the metabolites in E. coli, at the same time we were really learning how to measure uh, metabolites all the way up to human. And so there are these basic components of protein and nucleic acids, basic intermediates like fructose bisphosphate that exist at all of these levels. And if you survey relatively comprehensively, there's on the order of a thousand of them that have clear biological function. So it's a big problem, but it's a problem on the scale of you know, knowing all the kids who go to your high school. Not, not a problem of, you know, knowing everyone in the phone book in New York City, right? So it's a problem uh, that's right at this interface between uh, the human scale and the computational scale. So I wanted to ask you about that. You already kind of anticipated perhaps almost a question, which is, do we think we have the complete solution set here? I mean, we clearly know all of the amino acids. Uh, we clearly know all of the intermediate steps uh, and intermediaries period of the Krebs cycle. Do we think that that means we actually know every single metabolomic element, or is there a chance that there are others out there that we don't know because we haven't looked for them, or they're very short-lived, for example, and we haven't stopped and looked at reactions closely enough or studied the kinetics hard enough? I mean, this is almost a naive question in a way, but I've never actually thought about it until now. <laughs> 
Yeah, it, it's a great question, and we keep discovering uh, new metabolites. So uh, you know, groups around the world keep discovering new metabolites. Uh, I would say it's a interesting yin and yang because there's this steady accumulation of new metabolites, but I don't really think there's been a completely new and obviously important metabolite yet this century. Wow. Right, so I, I think at some level in terms of the metabolite finding part of the problem, things were wrapping up around the time of Krebs, uh, the most important part of the work anyway. Um, but in terms of understanding how the system really works and how we can choose the right diet to be healthy given our genotype, given the disease we're fighting, you know, we haven't scratched the surface yet. How many of these metabolites are really tightly regulated? Uh, a la glucose versus not that regulated at all. They can kind of fall to zero and they can, meaning how many of these things can change by log orders all over the mm -hmm. place and how many are regulated so tightly that if you just fall a little bit out of that range, I mean, you're dead. I mean, one of the things I try to explain to people when I explain regulation and homeostasis is I love using pH as an example because, you know, the pH spectrum runs from, you know, basically zero to 14 neutral being seven, but anybody who's taking care of a patient in the hospital knows that se you know 7.4 is where we live as an organism, almost unsurvivable to have an acidosis that goes below seven or an alkalosis that exceeds about 7.7. .7. I mean, you know, so for a system that runs basically, you know, zero to 14, the fact that we can't as a species survive from outside of seven to 7.6 or 7.7 .7, talks about something that is so tightly regulated. So in that field of metabolomics, which ones behave like pH and which ones don't? Well, you know, pH is such a great example, right? And you have this giant logarithmic scale from zero to 14, right? And so even when you talk about, you know, 7.1 to 7.4, you're talking about something, you know, of a, you know, yeah, it's two about a three, three fold change, two to three fold right? change in, in acid concentration. That's right. And, and I think uh, a lot of metabolites that are the important ones live typically in that two to three fold range as being the preferred range. Uh, some of them, there's a lot more active regulation like glucose. Some of them, uh, there's kind of relatively passive processes that tend to keep them in that range. Then of course there are all sorts of other metabolites that may be some cool secondary metabolite that's made by a plant and some of us eat it, some of us don't eat that plant, and so some of us may have a lot, some of us may have none. But for, for the big ones, the biochemistry textbook ones, I think you know this kind of a few fold range in the bloodstream is, is a common healthy place to be. Are there common and consistent tools that the body uses to regulate? Are there principles that the body just adopts over and over and over again in the form of this regulation? Yeah, I think there's one most important principle and that's when it's there, use it up. Uh, and so, you know, in a, a physics speak, you could say this is a, a um, linear consumption of circulating metabolites or in chemistry speak, uh, people call this mass action, just whatever mass is there, you tend to take it in. And so um, you eat, uh, a lot of what you eat after a little bit of processing enters the bloodstream and then it's the job of tissues that need these ingredients to use them and use them uh, at first blush in proportion to their availability in the blood. Are there examples where that regulatory mechanism is not the preferred way to manage them? Well, there's a lot of regulation layered over top of that in order to make the body work. And you know, the most important regulatory hormone in, in mammals, I'm pretty convinced is insulin, right? And you know, there are two ways uh, to look at insulin, I think. And there's the, probably the way that comes to mind first to you, which is, Insulin is a hormone that acts to control elevations in blood sugar, right? and it does that at the highest level by promoting uptake of glucose and preventing production of glucose. Right. But there's an alternative way to look at insulin, and that's 
that we've evolved mainly to be able to survive a lack of nutrients, okay? That this was the strong selective pressure on animals and mammals, and that storing fat is very precious, and that insulin is a hormone that says you don't have to use fat right now, okay? And so it senses that there's enough carbohydrate around, and therefore it's safe to not release uh, free fat from your adipose tissue. Does that mean that you think that an equally important role of insulin is not just the disposal of glucose into muscle and the cessation of glucose production in the liver, but you're saying it's equally important as a signal to stop lipolysis, to keep your fat in its fat stores, meaning save this for a rainier day because you actually have the glucose here that I'm going to deal with? Yeah, that's, that's certainly uh, how I look at insulin right now. And I, I think there's little doubt that, you know, biochemically and, and medically, the suppression of lipolysis is a primary, perhaps the primary, you know, function of insulin. So kind of going back to the broad strokes of metabolomics, you alluded to it briefly without, I think, using the term, but what do we know about the flux of these things? Because when I think back to my, even my biochemistry 25 years ago, you know, Stryer's textbook, which is, you know, the classic textbook, at least it was then, I imagine it's one of them still today. We really studied it in a static way. Um, and I'm guessing that that's one of the first questions you went after, right? Which is what's, What's the movement? What are the, what are the derivatives with respect to time of all of these things? So uh, maybe expand a little bit on this idea of, the, of fluxomics. Yeah, I, I mean, metabolism is a, a system in action. And I think this kind of static view of metabolism, which is probably never a view that Stryer ever had in his mind, but that got codified in the textbooks is one that kind of killed metabolism in a way as a, a topic of excitement. And so, you know, metabolites are intermediates in the process of converting what we eat into usable energy and protein biomass and these things. And so they're really, you know, relatively low in abundance and they're flowing very, very fast. So they're completely different than parts of our body like neurons that are gonna sit there maybe for our entire lifetime, okay? <laughs> Here the metabolites are meant to be made and used somewhere on the time scale, depending on the metabolite, of roughly a second to you know roughly an hour maybe for metabolites in the bloodstream. And so uh, all the action is in the flow. And so, um, it's really understanding where things are coming from, where they're going, uh, where we can learn about how metabolism works. Let's again, just use glucose because one, it's ubiquitous, everybody gets it, it's essential for life, but it also offers, I think, a beautiful portrait in velocity. So um, I just had my blood drawn yesterday. I draw my blood about every two months. And um, so, you know, tube of blood comes out and um, let's say my glucose on that, because that's a snapshot, right? That's literally mm -hmm. in that moment, yep. out comes five tubes of blood and it's going to look for a whole bunch of things, but one of them is glucose. And my glucose, because I did a finger prick at the same time, my glucose was 89 milligrams per deciliter. Can you explain to people what that actually means? What does it mean that my glucose at that moment in time was 89 milligrams per deciliter? Well, I'm sure you were smiling about it. That is like it's a, a super healthy blood glucose in terms of the level. But when, when you think of that absolute amount of glucose, right, if you took all the glucose in your bloodstream at that level, that's a few minutes of, of glucose or energy for the body, right? So Yeah, it's probably that what, has four to... or five grams of total glucose. Exactly. Yeah, 20 calories so... worth. Exactly. So that has to be constantly replenished in order to feed your brain and the other tissues like activated immune cells that depend on glucose. Now, this is what to me is remarkable. If I had done that same test, Josh, and I had come back, and let's make the math easy and say it was 90, we'd still say, great, you're healthy, your fasting glucose is 90. 
Now let's say I had come back and it was 180 milligrams per deciliter, my fasting glucose. There's a disease that I would immediately now know that I have. That disease is called type 2 diabetes. What's the absolute difference in the amount of glucose in my bloodstream? It went from being 5 grams to 10 grams? Mm -hmm. Seems like a really trivial amount. Why is it that the body in the person without diabetes seems to be able to keep it at, you know, 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter overnight while you're fasting, but in a disease that's going to more than double your risk of mortality and increase your risk of cancer, Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease. I mean, it's, 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 it's really a problem for your health. It's only doubling the amount of glucose in there, and it's still a relatively trivial amount that needs a constant, constant update. How yep. can we explain this delta of that seems so trivial in the absolute amount that could be consumed in just an extra couple of minutes, but yet the steady state is still off by this factor? What's going on and why? Yeah, I mean, when you think about why is that a disease problem with only a twofold excursion, then you think that, right, the system has been built to have about the most circulating glucose that you can have safely, right? And I think a lot of the really important metabolites have been kind of pushed to the edge this way, right? And so we know that there are deleterious, you know, protein modification reactions, glycosylation reactions that occur when glucose gets above this point. So we, we kind of in evolution pushed right up to the highest and non-problematic glucose. We didn't do that for a lot of other metabolites, and that's why there's not a lot of, you know, part of why there's not a lot of other diseases like diabetes. So, so that's part of the answer is that, you know, you know, evolution didn't build a lot of wiggle room for your glucose to safely rise because having that, you know, good amount of glucose circulating is really valuable, right? You know, every time your heart pumps, it's sending that amount of glucose to tissues, and that's productive. Um, uh, on the flip side, obviously, there's a broader set of derangements in the body to produce this twofold excursion in, in glucose, right? And so, you know, this has to do with, you know, things going wrong in fat and fat handling. And so that, that's part of this whole metabolic syndrome that leads to the full set of downstream health consequences. It's so interesting that the body doesn't just Again, I think this speaks to why the flux problem is the more interesting problem than the static problem. Because if you just think about this example in the static context, you would say, okay, well, at 7.04 and 3 seconds a.m., your blood sugar is 190. But three minutes later, if nothing changes, meaning if your liver doesn't put too much glucose back into circulation, you'll be fine. So yep. the problem is not that your blood sugar is too high in that moment. The problem is the liver assumes, I, I mean, in part, that that's the right level and it continues to do it because at that moment when you're not eating, that is the only source by which glucose is getting into the bloodstream. So we're maintaining this elevated cycle, right? It's, it's everything from gluconeogenesis, hepatic glucose output. I mean, all of these things continue to stay unregulated. And I think that's only really appreciated when you think of time and the passage of time. Yeah, I think one thing that's really interesting is that you can have, um, depending on the details of how processes are tuned, the, the same amount of production and the same amount of consumption, and these have to be balanced for your glucose to stay you know, anywhere close to steady, okay? So in a diabetic, production and consumption are balanced, and a healthy person, production and consumption are balanced. And they can even be the same amount of production and consumption, right. but it can just be that you need a higher amount of glucose to achieve that same balance of production and consumption in the diabetic. And, and that reflects uh, often, in, in my opinion at least, you know, underlying issues with how fat is handled, that you either need more glucose to induce more insulin in order to suppress lipolysis in the diabetic, right? Or more glucose to outcompete fat to get burnt in tissues. And so 
Ultimately, I think a, a lot of what's setting blood glucose is competition between glucose and fat. This is a very old uh, idea called the Randall hypothesis. But, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. We have a lot of new data that's consistent with it. And so I think a, a lot of these issues come back to making room for glucose to be burned by controlling the amount of fat that's being used by tissues. So can you state for folks the Randall hypothesis? I'd love to actually talk a little bit about the, the more recent data. Because as you said, I mean, this is, I mean, this is over 50 years old, isn't it? Uh, you know, I'm a terrible historian, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm going to trust you on that one. But, you know, I, I think the essence of the hypothesis is that fat is somewhere between a preferred and the preferred uh, fuel for tissues. And there's competition between carbohydrates, uh, classically glucose, and fat for burning. And so when fat is available, then glucose tends not to be burned effectively, and that's a possible cause of diabetes. Now, of course, when you say fat, you don't mean fat within adipose tissue. You mean fat I mean, within, you, you mean fat that's available for use? Fat that's available for use, and so that can come in multiple forms. The simplest way to think about it is free fatty acids that are floating in the bloodstream, and that may be the most important form of it, but there's you know also, uh, adipose stores within tissues, not um, subcutaneous white adipose, which is typically a healthy place to store fat molecules. But you can end up with what people call ectopic fat, for example, droplets of fat building up in muscle. And when those are there, they can compete with carbohydrate for being burned. Or you can have a uh, breakdown uh, of lipoproteins from the bloodstream, things like VLDL, okay, that we, we desperately need to have broken down in order to have a good HDL and a, you know, a low um, LDL cholesterol. Tell me about some of the more recent um, evidence around why that hypothesis may be more compelling, even so than when it was proposed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've been doing experiments that look at, you know, what are things that can suppress uh, glucose use in tissues? And one thing we see is it's just very clear that fat does this. We're certainly not the only people to do this. I think there's a long history of this, but it maybe hasn't been adequately appreciated just how fundamental that result is. And if you turn off uh, lipolysis different ways, then you rapidly induce glucose consumption. And if you provide other alternative fuels, and, and we've learned that lactate is a very important circulating fuel, and so it also will compete with glucose to suppress glucose use. So uh, the fact that you can have multiple different types of fuels, either fat or lactate, and any of them will suppress glucose use really makes me believe in this kind of competitive nutrient environment and that that plays a central role in determining whether you clear or don't clear glucose and how high your glucose has to go basically in order to be cleared. So let's talk a little bit about lactate because this is one of those things where, I, you know, now given how much I think about lactate, read about lactate, and we've had a number of podcasts where we get into some detail, either I was asleep through part of medical school or it just really wasn't presented in anything other than the following. When your demand for ATP gets high enough and quick enough, you're going to basically take glucose and when you turn it into pyruvate, rather than take the efficient path of shuttling pyruvate into acetyl-CoA through the Krebs cycle where you can generate lots of ATP requiring oxygen, you're gonna take a quicker path that's less efficient but doesn't require the same cellular oxygen and you'll turn pyruvate into lactate. You won't get nearly as much ATP and you'll also tend to generate a lot of lactate which tends to gravitate with hydrogen ions which tends to kind of poison the muscle a little bit and that's you know why it becomes rate limiting in terms of how long you can sustain that level of output. Maybe explain today why that's <clears throat> at you know the tip of the iceberg in a generous sense of the term? Well, I think it's all actually really important stuff. It's just only, as you say, part of the picture. And I think the other part of the picture is that mammals have been wired to use lactate as a major circulating nutrient. Um, 
it's a super, super fast turnover nutrient. So when you think about that glucose and you're having, you know, a few minutes supply uh, circulating in your blood, lactate, you have uh, even sh shorter supply than yet that. It's constantly being uh, made, released into the bloodstream and consumed. And it serves as an almost universal nutrient. There are transporters that'll carry it into uh, virtually any cell in your body. These are the MCH or is it the, uh, the MCT transporters? These, yeah, these are called MCT transporters, or so it stands for monocarboxylate because lactate has one carboxylic acid, if you think of it as a chemistry perspective. And so those transporters are ubiquitously expressed and they allow lactate basically to go everywhere. And so it's the universally- Which, which by the way, Josh, that already differs from kind of how we learned it in biochemistry mm -hmm. class, which was, all that lactate goes back to the liver and the Cori cycle turns lactate back into glucose and then just exports it down the, the glucose pathway via hepatic glucose output. And you're saying, I'd like to understand when that happens versus when each other tissue says, oh great, more fuel, let me take in this lactate. Yeah, I think the really important thing about lactate is that glucose penetration into tissues is actually heavily regulated it has to be heavily regulated so that if we go through a period of having low carb intake, there's still glucose preserved for the brain and for other cells uh, that particularly need it. And lactate is the universally available form of carbohydrate. And so, um, and I give an example like, you know, in a healthy heart, uh, at least in the fasted state, it basically will not touch glucose. Right. But so it's it will preferred use fuel as free fuel. fatty acid? Would that it's be preferred that? fuel as free fatty acids. Uh, it probably also gets some fatty acids from lipoproteins, and it definitely uses lactate and also things like ketone bodies. But this is like a, a very clear example of a tissue other than liver that net consumes lactate, just using it as a fuel to have you know, access to carbohydrate energy. Now, lactate is a, is a, is a, another metabolite that I pay a lot of attention to, Josh. So as regularly as I'm checking my glucose, I'm checking my lactate. And unlike glucose, the range is much greater, right? Like the lowest glucose I've ever measured in myself is probably 50 milligrams per deciliter. And the highest, not including the time Jerry Reven had me do an insulin suppression test at Stanford, and, they, and I almost died, actually. This is actually a ridiculous story um, because one of the IVs got blown and we didn't know that they were pushing glucose because I was just getting so hypoglycemic and um, I could feel it. You know, you learn in medical school what hypoglycemia feels like and when you start sweating really profusely, and this was like nothing I've ever experienced, it felt like a bucket of water got dumped on me so I knew, oh my God, I'm really, I'm, I'm, and I was like, they got to push glucose and I could feel the IV was blown. Anyway, to make a long story short, when they finally corrected it, my glucose got up to 240 milligrams per deciliter. So like there's, call it 250, right? That's a, <laughs> you know, a 5X range. But with lactate, I mean, I've measured it as low as 0.3 millimole and as high mm -hmm. as 20 millimole. Right, so that's a 60 fold difference. Yeah, that's, that's a big, big range, but it probably depends a lot on your physiological state. Well, of course, the 0.3 would be, you know, at rest and fasted. The mm -hmm. 20 is, you know, kind of an all out two minute effort. <laughs> but the point here is that's a much bigger range. And, and is this regulated? Is there an upper limit to how high lactate can go? Or is it simply how much pain you can tolerate? <laughs> In, in terms of what is necessary yeah. to generate lactate? Like, is there th truly an upper limit? I'm honestly not sure. I mean, it, you, you, may be, you may be right on the pain side of the scale, right? And, um, you know, this, this has to do with how fast its production and consumption are, right? So you can have that excursion to 20, and, you know, but that can goes be down clean, cleaned up quickly. in a few minutes, you yeah. know, if you're actually, you know, completely resting. So... Um, yeah, this is a very flexible metabolite this way.
When did people start to realize this, that, that lactate was a fuel? Because I, I remember first reading about this in about 2011, where people were starting to say, hey, neurons might like lactate besides glucose. Because at that point in time, there were really only two fuels that a neuron would ingest, right? So under normal circumstances, it was exclusively glucose. And then George Cahill showed in the 60s, yeah, but if you starve somebody, you can turn up to 60% of that fuel stock into beta-hydroxybutyrate. I think it was BHB, maybe it was acetoacetate, but it was, it was a ketone, right? So yeah. you'd be maybe 60-40 in favor of a ketone to glucose. But that was really it. And then there were these kind of whisperings and these you know animal studies that suggested, no, actually neurons will consume lactate. Where are we today on that front? Yeah, I think it's still very unclear which cell types in the brain are the lactate consumers versus lactate producers. Certainly there's lactate use in the brain. And is it more astrocytes, neurons, do we know? I, I think it's really an active area investigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I think I bring biases to it, but I, I don't bring answers. You know, my <laughs> bias is that, you know, we are a, a, a neuron-centric uh, form of thinker, right? And we didn't <clears throat> evolve to make glucose a unique brain fuel in order to feed astrocytes. We did it to feed neurons. So I, I do think there's a special neuronal dependence on, on glucose. Um, but, uh, you know, as a lactate goes everywhere, so it probably goes into both astrocytes and neurons as a, a fuel in the right circumstances. And it, it probably can be excreted from both as a waste, depending on exactly what activities are required in the brain at that time. And that's really the beauty of lactate is it allows you a tremendous degree of flexibility that wouldn't exist otherwise. And this was actually, um, you know, thought about a lot by a guy named Brooks at Berkeley who- George you know, Brooks. Yeah, recognized yeah. the you know, uh, ubiquitous uh, potential for lactate as a fuel. And I think you know, we were able to contribute to that story by really showing it. Yes, you know, using, using mass spectrometry to make it uh, crystal clear that this usage happens uh, throughout the whole body. So what is the evolutionary reason in your mind for why the body would allow most tissues to love lactate as a fuel directly versus just having the liver mop it up at the same kinetic rate, turn it into glucose and shoot that glucose out? Is there, is there an obvious reason for why the current strategy is a better one? Uh, yeah, it's not an easy answer, but I think there are strong reasons. And I'll say that We've lately done experiments in yeast, actually, right? and you know, yeast make ethanol as waste, and people always, I think, assume that you know, yeast face this exact same choice that um, you talked about when you get to the level of pyruvate. Either do you spit it out as a redox balanced waste in, in humans, that's done as lactate, and yeast that's done as ethanol, or do you take the pyruvate into the TCA cycle? We see that going all the way back to yeast, that's a false choice. Right? The default is to spit out the redox balanced waste. Okay? And then you can always pick the waste up and reuse it if you need energy from the TCA cycle. And so I think this goes back to the very earliest days of eukaryotic life, basically, that you want to be able to run glycolysis whenever you need to run glycolysis. So use glucose whenever you need to use glucose. That takes you to pyruvate. You've created a redox problem, okay, because you have electrons from the glucose that are not sitting on the pyruvate. And the first priority is always to solve that redox problem. That's achieved in our bodies by spitting out lactate. And you don't really want to hold that problem within cells in your body. You want to get that all the way under the circulation so every cell in your body can work on this master metabolic challenge of keeping you know, electrons balanced. Then whoever needs energy, okay, and these electrons are a super valuable source of energy, can pick them up in the form of lactate. And so there's been kind of this um, false coupling of oxidative and glycolytic metabolism in the way biochemistry is taught, when really our bodies, uh, and eukaryotes all the way back to yeast, are, are really designed to be much more flexible, to allow these two processes to happen 
uh, in yeast completely independently because they really can just spit out ethanol to the environment in us quasi-independently. So independently at the level of individual cells in our body. So none of them faces this pressure, okay? And that's really good. So if you have a bout of hypoxia, okay, you can release lactate and elsewhere in the body, the problem can be cleaned up. Now in our bodies, it has to be cleaned up within the body somewhere, okay? Because we don't have any master release valve for this. So all of our cells together have to solve this problem. Meaning the way that yeast can literally eject ethanol from their cell and get it away, mm -hmm. we can't emit lactate from our body. We can emit it from a cell, but it's still part of the broader system. Exactly. And that's when you get into medical problems that like lactic acidosis, if you have a very fundamental metabolic deficiency, or if, you know, God forbid someone put a bag over your head and you couldn't breathe, right? Then, then you end up in this crisis of redox imbalance. But we distribute that problem across the body through this concentrating lactate in and out of cells and letting whatever cells that need uh, carbohydrate energy use the lactate. The system would be way, way less flexible if you know only the liver could clean this up. And it would be also way less commensurate with effective burst exercise. Okay? Uh, you know, the heart is super well perfused and if muscle is making a if less well perfused muscle that's far from the heart, okay, so it's hard to get oxygen there, is making a lot of lactate. Of course, it's very advantageous at that moment for the heart, which is sitting on more oxygen than it needs to use lactate rather than fatty acids, which are better long-term things to store for the future anyway. So it's way, way better to have the system designed this way. And is that regulated then locally? Is that regulated at each cell? Like how is that decision made? Because how does that myocyte in the heart know the energy of the entire system so that it can make the decision that is a, in the short run counterintuitive. You know, it seems medically or maybe textbook uh, med school counterintuitive, but it's physical chemistry, uh, pure intuition. Well, well no, okay, no, yeah, right? yeah, so, it, so, Lactate goes up and so, it but, gets but regardless, burnt. how but how is the decision made? Are you saying it's just made on mass balance and availability yeah, it's, of it's, substrate? Yeah, it's made on ma it's made on mass action and availability of substrate. So there's yeah, no okay. decision. Okay, that, that this it's it's pure physics basically. Yeah. Okay. Now I see what you're saying. So um, it's basically a gradient problem across the board. Mm hmm. If you have too much lactate, it flows out. If you are short on energy, it flows in. So tell me more about lactate. I'll tell you one thing that has, I've become very interested in clinically is the implication of fasting lactate levels in the population. So, um, if you, you know, measure a person's lactate level first thing in the morning, you're going to see quite a bit of variability mm -hmm. and it seems to be proportional to their metabolic health. The higher that number, the less metabolically healthy they are. Um, it's not uncommon in someone who's insulin resistant to see fasting lactate levels approaching two millimol with no activity. Whereas in a healthy individual, it'll be below 0.5 millimol. What do you think that tells us about fuel partitioning and this problem of metabolomics? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a correlation between fasting glucose and fasting lactate, but lactate is the kind of maybe harder to measure, but perhaps even more intimately tied to the essence of metabolic dysfunction molecule. And I think, you know, very much, you know, the, the way you said it, that, you know, it, it reads out uh, a few things, you know, it, when lactate is high, it reflects the fact that during these times of fasting, when glucose is not really supposed to be being used much, okay, you're still using too much glucose, converting too much of it to lactate. And at the same time, your lactate clearance system isn't working very well. And typically that's because you're having competition between lactate and fat to be burned. And, you know, so this all feeds into the syndrome of diabetes. Now, there's another interesting push observation that I've made, which is I wake up in the morning check a lactate, it's 0.4 millimole. I eat the biggest carbohydrate meal I can ingest. Don't lift a finger other than to feed myself. 
I recheck my lactate in an hour, it's one millimole. Mm -hmm. Why did that happen? I mean, we can understand the biochemistry, right? Which is I have more glucose to metabolize. But this get, kind of gets back to your point of med school biochemistry would suggest my lactate should not have gone up. I'm taking glucose. I'm making pyruvate. I have endless cellular oxygen. I should be running that pyruvate through the Krebs cycle, and I shouldn't see any uptick in lactate. But that's exactly what I don't see. Yeah, I mean, circulating lactate is an intermediary in glucose catabolism. And uh, that's just the way the body works. It's not what we were taught in med school. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, do you have a sense of, uh, of how it's being taught today? Do you, do you get the sense that, that biochemistry students at Princeton and Stanford today are being taught what we were taught with respect to this sort of, um, more rigid model of, of lactate and it's as a, as a, as a metabolite? Well, I'm probably chipping away at it at Princeton, but it, you know, I, I don't know, uh, how much it's shifting at the medical education level yet. Uh, probably thank God I haven't sat through those classes at Stanford again, but, um, it, it, I think it's something that we should see shift and, and I hope we see the next generation of biochemistry textbooks talk about circulating lactate as an intermediary in glucose catabolism. I think that's a really fundamental thing for people who want to just think about metabolism accurately to know. And as you say, it, it, you can do this, the self experiment very simply and see it. And I think it's a very interesting thing to consider from a prognostic standpoint. You know, when you go back and look at Jerry Reven's five criteria for what was then syndrome X and what is now metabolic syndrome, fasting glucose is still one of them. You could make a case that fasting lactate would be more telling. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think the challenge with lactate is that it is a metabolite that can get up and down faster. And one response to stress is to rapidly convert glucose into lactate. <laughs> And so that's just part of your body activating. But of course, there are people who have stress at a blood draw. And because you know, lactate is a little bit more fluctuating this way, there are going to be pros and cons medically in terms of using it as a biomarker. You know, I, I don't think our problem with metabolic syndrome anyway is diagnosing it, right? <laughs> our, our problem is preventing it. Yeah, although what I would argue is I think we treat metabolic syndrome too discreetly and I think we come to it too late, right? I think we mm -hmm. should be looking for things far before you actually have hypertension and truncal obesity and dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia. And I do wonder with nothing other than just intuition if um, lactate dysregulation, for lack of a better word, might be one of the earlier canaries in the coal mine. I totally agree with that. I want to go back to something that we've talked about a couple of times. You've mentioned it in passing. You and I know what it's about, but I think it's such an important part of where we're going to go in a discussion that I almost need you to go into full prof mode and really explain two things, which are obviously highly related in a moment. You'll see. The first is how the electron transport chain works. So what is, what is the Krebs cycle doing and how is that feeding into this massive generation of energy currency? And specifically, can you talk about it with special attention to the concept of redox? And I, sure. I would encourage you, Josh, to take as much time as you need because the more the listeners understand this, the more they'll be able to understand NAD NADP, NADPH, NR, NMN, all of these other things that people really care about. But I think unfortunately they've been conditioned into very glib understandings of these things, which I think are serving no one any benefit without actually going back to understanding the root of this problem. Now that's a great framing. So, you know, you can think of it this way, fundamentally, you know, you eat three macronutrients, carbs and protein and fat. And in a healthy adult, um, to first approximation, every carbon atom that you eat in any of those three forms needs to exit your body as exhaled carbon dioxide. Okay. 
And all of that exhaled carbon dioxide to first approximation is made in the TCA cycle. And uh, the main way that nutrients flow into the TCA cycle to become carbon dioxide is first turning into pieces that are two carbon units uh, in size. Right? And so from carbohydrate, the basic flow is glucose to lactate, and then lactate to pyruvate to a two carbon piece that goes into the TCA cycle. Fat is basically composed of pre-assembled two carbon pieces, so they just get chopped up two carbon pieces at a time. And the protein part is a little more complicated. We can probably skip it, okay? So you end up with these two carbon units. But worth, worth just sort of noting, Josh, that protein really, the primary role of protein is actually the nitrogen side, which we're kind of putting into these amino acids that are building blocks. It's really less of an energy substrate, but it does have that, carboxylic acid on it that still has to go through this cycle and be exhaled. But that's, that's in other words, that's why we'll skip it for now, because it's really not a significant energetic component, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on the kind of diet you eat, right? If you... So if you're very, on a carnivore very, diet, that, that, <laughs> then it's probably a different situation, yeah. It's a very interesting side discussion, but ultimately, you know, unless you're gaining protein mass, which of course, wonderful for us guys anyway, when that happens, typically at least societally smiles on it, um, you know, but other than that, you know, whatever amino acid carbon you take in in the form of protein has to be balanced with also amino acid catabolism. So uh, at that level, it's not that different than, than carbs and fat. It's just a little different in that it can enter the TCA cycle sometimes also as four carbon pieces. Uh, but a lot of amino acids are broken down into these same two carbon pieces. There are just 20 of them. So it's, uh, you know, no one wants to hear a discussion of how <laughs> all, all 20 of them get chopped up. Um, so ultimately you end up with these two carbon pieces and then uh, they congeal with a four carbon piece and that makes citrate. And a lot of, you know, one of the problems with the Krebs cycle is that it has three names, okay? The Krebs cycle in honor of the, amazing biochemist who uh, played a key role in, in figuring it out. Uh, the citric acid cycle, and that's named for this condensation molecule of the four carbon and the two carbon piece citrate. Um, or the TCA cycle, and TCA is tricarboxylic acid, and that's because citrate has three carboxylic acids, okay? so. You have this uh, cycle that unfortunately has three names, but that um, it's probably three times as important as anything else in metabolism, so maybe it's fair. <laughs> um, so uh, ultimately, as this cycle turns, it's going to spit off the two carbon pieces that uh, came in as carbon dioxide. And in so doing, it's going to take the electrons that were part of those two carbon pieces and pass them to this uh, famous cofactor NAD to make NADH, okay? And um, that H stands for hydrogen, okay? And that hydrogen is really uh, one proton and two electrons. And so this is another confusing nomenclature thing that you just can think of that H, even though it may sound to those who've taken for, you know, freshman chemistry like H plus, like acid, this is an H with two electrons stuck to it. So it's really what we call hydride or uh, electrical form of chemical energy. And so then uh, the NADH that's made from NAD there is what feeds into the electron transport chain and those electrons then flow through a series of proteins that sit in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, the mitochondria have two membranes. The outer one is kind of leaky and you know, kind of not so important. The inner one is super tight and has a ton of regulation in it. And most importantly, uh, can be used to pump protons to one side or the other. 
and ultimately it's the pumping of protons out of the mitochondria that's the function of the electron transport chain and in this kind of metabolic flux way that we talked about earlier the protons that get pumped out just flow right back in but as they flow back in they turn a turnstile and as that turnstile turns it squeezes ADP and inorganic phosphate physically squeezes them together to make ATP the master energy currency that we use to power our neurons for thinking, our muscles for moving, and so on. So one of the things about this system that is just so beautiful <clears throat> is the transition from chemical energy to electrical energy back to chemical energy. And I, you know, I've tried to explain this to my daughter. She's 13. She's not fully in love with it yet, but I know at some point it'll be a more <laughs> fun discussion. But it really is a miracle, right? Like. <clears throat> So much of biology just seems like it's hard to believe it all worked out. But if you were going to rank all the things that I can't believe it worked out, this has got to be in the top five, right? It's like, let's go back to the basics again. You, you eat a piece of bread, right? You're eating glucose. It has these carbon to carbon bonds and carbon to hydrogen bonds and some carbon to oxygen bonds. Now, refresh my memory, but carbon to oxygen is not a very energetic bond, right? You know, this is a, an, another thing where you have to be careful with the nomenclature. So like CO double bonds are spectacular bonds. They're super high energy, but that's where life, or I didn't say life, that's where uh, physics and chemistry want to flow too. They want to make these high energy bonds. And in making high energy bonds, you can release a lot of energy. And so uh, those are bonds that are, are very energetically favorable. Right? So they're the end state. It's the CH bonds, as you're alluding to, that start out energetically loaded. Okay, They're less energetically good in and of themselves so they have the potential to become something better yeah it's the it's the potential that i really yeah it, and i'm glad you're i'm glad you're adding this level of, of sort of chemical rigor to this so yeah the point i want to make is that the, these these carbon 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 and hydrogen bonds have this potential that this entire cycle with three names that's so wonderful basically liberates it basically says we're going to take that chemical energy and we're going to liberate it through electron transferring apparatus. And then at the last second, using that, I love the turnstile analogy, right? We're basically going to quickly shunt it right back into a chemical bond, which is the P binding to the ADP to make the ATP. And now we have this energy currency that is going to go and do its own thing. And it has lots of different ways that it unleashes itself. So. Explain to people the difference between oxidation and reduction in chemical terms, because I think people have to at least hear once what's an oxidation reaction, what's a reduction reaction, and then why we use the term redox synonymously with these two. Right. So um, oxidation and reduction are always coupled, okay? And they refer to the movement of electrons. And so when electrons go from uh, substance A to substance B, okay, the one that gives up the electrons is oxidized. It's subject to oxidation. The one that receives the electrons is reduced, okay? It's the subject of reduction. Let's talk about redox pairing. So you already brought up NAD and NADH. So talk about how oxidation reduction pairing works with those two to facilitate the electron transfer down this lovely chain of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Right. So this is a, a pair where NAD is the oxidized form. NADH is the electron holding or reduced form. And it normally exists in a quite uh, biased ratio towards a lot of NAD and a small amount of NADH. Right? And the way nature works is that whenever um, any pair of chemicals is uh, skewed in one direction, it's favorable to turn the one that's abundant into the one that's less abundant. And so this makes NAD a, a decent electron acceptor. And so it's sitting there prepared to pick up electrons from these uh, intermediates, carbon intermediates of the TCA cycle that are coming from carbohydrate and fat. And 
take the electrons, make NADH, which then can feed into the electron transport chain. And that back end has to happen fast in order to keep this ratio uh, skewed so you have mainly NAD and not too much NADH. And, and that's really important because when that NADH starts creeping up, all sorts of things start going wrong. Such as? Well, the NADH going up will uh, drive too many electrons into the electron transport chain. And going back to uh, Nav, you know, he's done a spectacular job showing how that leads to production of free radicals. And so when you, you need a, the right amount of this, but this is a, a clear way to get toxic amounts of free radicals if you have NADH buildup. Secondly, it just gums up metabolism if you have uh, too much NADH relative to NAD. And so then you can get into problems not having enough ATP. And, so, uh, and then it can also make signaling things go awry. Now, are there clinical scenarios in which we see that happen? Or are these more typically, there are things that result from toxicities where you know, for, like, you know, the, the classic thing you learn in medical school to explain the significance of this whole system is cyanide, right? You know, mm -hmm. maybe tell folks how cyanide works. And I don't know if that's too extreme an example of how this system can be hijacked, but, but let's see. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, obviously, you know, cyanide is electron transport chain inhibitor. And so that leads to the whole system just backing up a bit by bit. And so you can't then transfer electrons from NADH into the electron transport chain. And so NADH goes way up, NAD falls to the floor, and then you have no way to make ATP. And that unfortunately leads to rapid mortality, right? Um, yeah, and that's, that's, that's an interesting point because it speaks to, this again comes back to the kinetics and the flux, which is it, it's not like cyanide kills you in an hour. I mean, it kills you in seconds. It, it's really a sobering thought. Yeah, ATP turnover via this system is on the time scale of a, a second. Um, and so same for NADH. And so these are things that are just whizzing through uh, our bodies all the time and that we're constantly dependent on. Are there Are there less extreme examples, Josh, of things that will put that balance in the wrong direction kind of chronically? I think it's a really interesting question. I, I mean, and I don't want to give the misimpression that, you know, the right thing is to have as much NAD and as little NADH as possible, right? This is a, first of all, it's designed to be a dynamic system. You know, if you undergo intense exercise, you're going to drive NADH up, and this is a very healthy context for doing this transiently. Um, metformin, of course, is a super interesting medication and probably up, works, yeah. you know, mainly by slowing the conversion of NADH back to NAD by impairing the complex one of the electron transport chain, the one that does this initial electron offloading from NADH to make NAD. How, how well is that understood? I mean, this is, you'll talk to five people who study metformin and they'll tell you five different things, which I think just tells you how much we don't know. But what, what is your view of the, I, I don't think it's really disputed that metformin inhibits complex one, is it? I think the broader question is how much is that the main attraction versus kind of a sideshow, right? Yeah, I'll say, you know, there are many people who know more about this than me, but one thing that we tend to do in our lab sometimes is take these kind of um, famous metabolic effects like metformin inhibiting complex one and just do a quick test of it. And I say when we do that, about half the time they look to be true and half the time they look to be dubious. Right? And metformin was a shining star in our hands in inhibiting complex one. It was one of the cases where I really felt like, you know, it may do other things, but it certainly does what it's supposed to do there. It does that strongly. And I think it's probably the fact that it does it in a relatively liver specific way due to the way that metformin enters cells of the body that leads to it, first of all, being safe, okay? There are many things that make it safer than cyanide, but it is really crazy that you know it's the, maybe the world's most widely used medication is it inhibits at some the level, electron uh, transport uh, chain. Yeah, yeah, and it's a mechanistic analog of cyanide, right? And so you have like one of the most acutely lethal substances and the most widely used drug working in a remarkably similar way. And so I think the fact that there's a strong liver specificity is probably what makes it you know 
net beneficial for at least a subset of people. And and what's the what's the what's the change that you saw in your lab, Josh, between so if you go or off metformin, what's your NADH to NAD ratio and then on metformin, how much did it change that? Uh, it depends how much metformin you, you use. But if you tried to approximate like a, a you do your best to approximate a, a, an actual clinical dose of, you know, say a couple grams a day. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we did this in a way that I would consider mm. clinically applicable. So, uh, but but I'll say that it, it, it's certainly crystal clear that it, it goes in the right direction. And so it doesn't surprise you that metformin would raise fasting lactate levels, correct? No, I mean, it certainly is aligned to do that, right? And that's just backing up further. It's, it's just basically creating more of a roadblock into the TCA is going to give you more lactate. Yep. More of a road back and electron disposal, basically. Do you think that that's a neutral effect or do you think that that's a potentially deleterious effect of metformin that is probably offset in a patient with diabetes by the benefits that it has on hepatic glucose output? That's a great question. I don't think I know. I mean, I think having more circulating lactate can be... Uh, you know, a bit of a challenge for clearing fat, right? Because they have some sort of competition. So from that perspective, I think, you know, being in a, a lower state might have some benefits, but then, you know, lactate is a valuable fuel as long as it's not getting to too high levels. So I, I, I'm not sure how that all plays out in terms of long-term health. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Anything you want to say about NADP and NADPH, just to round it out so people know the full story? Uh, yeah, these are you know super uh, important cofactors that um, personally I'm very obsessed with. Um, that are kind of they live just on the edge of what people who take biochemistry either in uh, undergraduate or med school learn about or don't learn about, and. Um, they're fascinating cofactors because in terms of their intrinsic chemistry, all their intrinsic chemistry from the energy point of view is exactly the same as NAD, NADH, but they have a different handle on them uh, chemically that allows biology to use them in a different way. And the, the ratio is maintained uh, quite different level from NAD, NADH. So NAD, NADH is super biased towards NAD this is much more of an even pairing, which means that uh, there's much more driving force to dump the electrons off, okay, rather than to absorb them up. And so NADPH is really, to me, second only to ATP, uh, a master uh, energetic um, building material. Hey, and it's the building material that's used, for example, to assemble fat. I mean, it's the most important one. So as you take uh, pieces, two carbon pieces from carbohydrate and want to put them together to make fat, you keep dumping in electrical energy in the form of NADPH. Um, and then NADPH is used in all sorts of other really interesting ways to fight reactive oxygen species. It's also used if you're trying to kill bacteria to intentionally make reactive oxygen species. <clears throat> so th this is where biology is freaking confusing and complicated. And there's definitely the yin and yang that you have this um, awesome cofactor that's so important for fighting oxidative stress and also can be used to create boatloads of oxidative stress intentionally uh, when it's needed. First of all, that was a fantastic overview of how the Krebs cycle works and specifically with attention to how electrons move through it and move through these um, redox factors, which then brings us to, I think, a part of the discussion where a lot of people have an enormous interest, which is, I don't know, go back seven, eight years, it started to become fashionable and it's only become more fashionable to talk about supplementing with NAD. I say that quote unquote, and we're gonna talk about why you don't actually supplement with NAD. But is it safe to say that at least part of the impetus for this was the observation that as we age, cellular NAD levels decline, and you've already made a very compelling case for why NAD is important 
I mean, I don't, I, I, I almost want to avoid the whole Sir Two inside of this because I think that story keeps changing. So maybe we can just, unless you feel strongly or compelled to get into Sir Tuans, we can put those aside for the moment. Yeah, I love putting sirtuins aside. Um, <laughs> let's let's just get to real metabolism. Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, I think the first um, principles in this field are great, right? That you know, NAD plays this super central role in energy generation. That we all want to feel more energetic, whether you know you want to be a more extremely successful athlete at age 21, or whether you want to feel at age uh, 50, like I am, or later, you know, like you're 21. Um, and, and so you think, you know, if we could just, you know, turn up the the burner capacity, right? Th this would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and then we have this data that NAD is depleted with aging. Although I have to say, when we do those measurements, we agree that NAD is depleted with aging, but it is a lot more subtle than you know you would think uh, looking at the literature. And so these are really quite subtle NAD depletions. You know, we were talking about these ranges earlier, and you know, the kind of threefold uh, range where a lot of metabolites live on a daily basis. Some of them, glucose, that's their worst day, right? And yep. as you pointed out, some of them like lactate, you know, they may do the threefold all the time. And then the 60 fold when you stress them, uh, the NAD changes we see with aging are like, you know, 10%, 20%. Oh, wow. They're, I didn't realize it was that little, Josh. Yeah. So I, I think, um, and I'm not saying that in some tissue of, you know, an aged human, there might not be bigger effects, but I think this is the first caution I would give to people thinking that they're going to fix everything through uh, NAD. And um, so, the, you know, on one hand, it's a robust finding that this is something that changes with aging that with a central metabolic role. On the other hand, it's something that happens with a, a fair amount of subtlety. Can you explain to folks how this is done? Because, again, we, I mean, you know, we talk about measurement sometimes a little too glibly, right? So it's pretty easy to explain how we can measure glucose and hemoglobin and lactate. At the other end of the spectrum, we've talked a lot about ATP, but, but I, what I think most people don't understand is it's very difficult to measure ATP. It comes back to what you said a moment ago. This ain't sticking around a very long time, right? You're using MRS and super complicated physics to be able to measure these things. Where does NAD fit on that spectrum and how do you actually measure it? Yeah, I mean, I think the good news is that NAD um, unlike NADH, is not like one of these you know, super transient metabolites, and so NADH measurement is wickedly difficult. But you know, most of this NADH NAD pair sits as NAD, and it tends to sit around for you know, um, hour-ish time scale. Oh, so you don't even have to you don't necessarily have to flash freeze tissue or things like that. That's right. You have you have some more flexibility in making those uh, measurements as long as you're not irritating the tissue in a way that leads to you know massive NAD degradation, which you know people may do uh, sometimes by accident. But I, I think generally it's not that hard of a measurement um, NAD. Obviously, like ATP, it's a tissue metabolite, not a circulating metabolite. So you need biopsy specimens to measure it. Uh, I'm not a master of the literature of, you know, NAD uh, levels in human tissues, but my um, not fully informed perspective is that there probably isn't as much as we should have. Okay? And that's because it's hard to get biopsies yeah. from, from people. And, and if, you, if, you took, if you take blood, if you take a whole mm -hmm. blood and you look at PBMC, can you look at NAD levels in there with relative ease? Or is it too complicated because by the time you separate the PBMC, you've kind of lost your window? I think it's a really good question um, because there is quite active NAD metabolism in uh, immune cells. So, yeah, I, I'm not an expert in this, I, but I, I bet there's a way you could develop a good protocol. I, I haven't followed you know, how good the measurements up to now have been. So most of what you've measured has been in tissue? 
Yeah, typically, you know, we work a lot in mouse. Sometimes we measure human, but more typically on the cancer side. And um, yeah, there we just take tissues and freeze them and, you know, extract metabolites, do mass spec. You're seeing a consistent, clear decline in NAD with the aging animal or human, but it's, I mean, it's not a fold reduction. It's a percent reduction, 10%, 20% reduction. And that's, that's the most common thing. Yeah. Okay. So this, this generates a hypothesis. The hypothesis is if you restore NAD levels in the old organism to the level that they were in the young organism, the old organism will feel and perform like the young organism. That's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis would be if you induce supranormal levels of NAD in any organism, they will feel supranormal. So let's assume that both of those hypotheses are simultaneously testable. What happened five, seven, eight years ago, NAD clinics started popping up all over the place. And they started saying, if you come here, we'll put IVs in you and we'll give you NAD. So let's first explain why did they do this intravenously? Why couldn't they make an NAD pill? Yeah. So, um, NAD and its precursors are broken down in the gastrointestinal tract. And so, um, you know, if you take, you know, NR, for example, so nicotinamide riboside orally, it mainly will enter the body in the form of nicotinic acid or niacin, right? which is a healthy substance, so there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, it, it, except for maybe the epithelium or gastrointestinal tract, you know, the body is not seeing nicotinamide riboside. And, and NAD, just to be clear, because we're going to talk about NR and NMN in a moment, but NAD, there's no way to orally take it, right? It has to be. Yeah, there, there's no known absorption route for NAD. And I, I think it'll get broken down probably all the way to nicotinic acid, although I'm not 100% sure anyone has proven that. But it, I certainly don't think it would enter the body any other way than either nicotinamide, which is like, you know, a little bit closer to remaking NAD or, or nicotinic acid. So what happens when a person receives intravenous NAD? What's the fate of that NAD? Because, uh, you know, one of the things in uh, metabolism and biology is anytime you put something in a vein, you bypass the liver with something called mm -hmm. the first pass effect, which in your former life was very important because when you had these patients in the ER that you were giving inhaled drugs to, it's not just the speed with which they were getting it, it's that you didn't, you could actually deliver the exact drug you wanted, not a pro drug that could be modified by the liver. So this idea of giving intravenous NAD is at least theoretically interesting because you're putting the molecule of interest directly into the venous system. So what's its fate? I think, and you, and you may be more up on this than me, but that, you know, it's going to get broken down partially, right? Because there's not clear uptake mechanisms known anyway to get NAD from the bloodstream into cells. Um, nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, I think may be able to enter cells directly or nicotinamide riboside. So these are partially broken down forms of NAD, but that are nevertheless meaningfully closer to NAD than the normal things that circulate uh, in good amounts in our bloodstream. And um, that does partially, I would say, short circuit the route to cells making NAD. So they kind of can break down partially the NAD uh, in the bloodstream, uh, take these uh, partially broken down NAD precursors uh, into cells and rebuild NAD in a shortcut manner uh, that probably has a good chance to bolster NAD levels. So in other words, when you give intravenous NAD, there is no transporter to take NAD into a cell but that NAD breaks down into things like NR and NMN. And in the vascular system, we know that those things can get taken up at least into some cells. Do we know which cells have the capacity to do that or which cells don't? I don't know that I'm the best expert to ask that, but I, yeah, I think, I think certainly at least 
some important cell types in the body can take those up and may, maybe pretty broadly, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. When the NR or NMN gets into the cell, is it relatively straightforward that it will be reconstituted into NAD? Like what's the, um, uh, what's the uh, energetic cost of doing that or you know, how easy is that? And is that, is that the favored reaction at that point? Yeah, I think it's the favored reaction, which is the important thing. And this is not a big demand, relatively speaking. You know, the, the big energy flow is through this NAD and uh, NADH exchange, but the making of NAD itself is not an expensive process per se. And um, so, yeah, you get these pieces. You can kind of think, so NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And so it's two kind of nucleotide pieces put together. And when you take in NR or NMN, it's uh, one of those two pieces, but the more interesting side. And the other side comes from ATP and it's there all the time because all your cells have ATP or you got much, much deeper problems. Yeah. And so you just snap it together and I think you end up with, you know, probably effective NAD supplementation when you go the IV route. In other words, taking IV NAD will probably increase into intracellular NAD levels, though not directly because there's not a transporter, but it goes through this sort of circuitous route to get there. So it might not be the most efficient way to do it, but uh, it, it, this certainly corrects a statement I've made in the past, which is intravenous NAD is not a good way to get NAD because we don't have a transporter. That's correct, but incomplete. I think that's a fair summary from my perspective. In other words, we don't really know how much, if you take a hundred units of NAD intravenously infused, we don't really know how many units ultimately make their way into a cell, but it's probably not a hundred. Yeah, I'm sure there's a fair amount of loss in the process. I mean, there, there's a very interesting protein uh, called CD38 that's, I think, designed to... Um, control these kind of pathways, okay? And it, it's a suppressor of NAD levels. And um, it, it works, I think, by breaking down NAD that's outside of cells. And mainly, there's not normally in physiology NAD in meaningful amounts probably outside of cells, but there is uh, NMN in meaningful amounts. And so this is a protein that's super good at breaking down NMN. Uh, it still leaves you with NR, which is still, uh, so it's one step further away from being NAD, but it's still meaningfully closer than your typical physiological precursor. And so I think it's positioned to, as you say, at least some places in the body boost NAD. Today, I think the majority of efforts to increase intracellular NAD are done through oral uh, precursors, and the two are NR and NMN, which, as you said, are pretty similar. And ha ha are you aware of a more convincing argument for why one might be a more preferred substrate? I, I haven't particularly seen arguments that one is superior than the other. Uh, I've seen some unpublished data that suggests one can be made more temperature and moisture stable than the other, but um, let's put that aside for the moment. Would you consider these to a first approximation equivalent approaches? Yeah. Okay. So now talk about something else that you said that is also kind of news to me, which is what is the effect of the gastrointestinal tract on, um, these agents? Yeah. I mean, they get broken down and they get broken down, um, all the way to the level of nicotinic acid or niacin basically. And um, this is the main way they enter the body. It doesn't mean that you know, there can't be a trickle of them entering some other way that has a physiological effect or that there's some local effect or some effect on the microbiome of taking them. So they're, you know, biology is super complicated. There are ways that these could be doing interesting health supporting things, but I don't really think they're fundamentally different than taking a physician prescribed niacin pill from the perspective of providing NAD precursors. Now a physician prescribed niacin pill, when people used to take niacin for hyperbeta lipoproteinemia, right? Which is 
really, obviously, no, I mean, I should, there's probably still some patients out there who take niacin, unfortunately, but it wasn't uncommon to get a real flush from the medication. Now, I don't remember what doses people were taking, but I feel like it was on the order of grams, mm -hmm. not yeah. milligrams. Yep. Do, do you recall how much niacin you would need to give somebody for them to experience an actual flush? I think it was a few grams. I think that that's where my recollection is too. Okay. So, so is that the reason people don't experience a flush with NR and NMN because they're typically taking, you know, 500 milligrams to one gram and that's simply not going to produce enough niacin to reach that threshold? Yeah. They're also kind of niacin pro drugs. So they probably are delayed absorption forms of niacin. So that may smooth things out enough. So they may be better tolerated, but I think this is how I'd fundamentally think about them is that they're niacin pro drugs. Your lab has done some, some of the flux work on this, correct? What, what are some of the most interesting things you've learned about how NR and how NMN when given orally end up in different tissues and what the effect is in the liver versus the muscle versus the plasma? Yeah, I think the main thing you see is that, you know, these are converted to niacin. They will raise niacin, particularly niacin heading to the liver out of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So in the what we call the portal circulation that connects, you know, your intestine to the liver uh, very effectively. And that, you know, other than that, their effect on like bo boosting their own circulating levels is um, somewhere between subtle and vanishing. Uh, I'm still not sure which of those two it is, but I, I think they certainly remain in the bloodstream much less abundant than nicotinamide, which is the thing the liver is normally producing to feed NAD precursor to the tissues of the body. And so there, there's, from what we have seen, no clear route for oral NR or oral NMN to produce circulating levels of NR or NMN that are high enough to compete at least at a standard concentration level with nicotinamide, the physiological precursor as, as a way of feeding NAD precursors to tissue. So basically at some level they don't change what's happening and what most of your tissues are seeing that much if our measurements are correct. Where do you think you could be fooled on this? I mean, I know that's a question every scientist or every good scientist asks themselves that question, right? How can we be fooled by our measurements? I'm sure you've thought about this. Where, where do you see this, the opportunities in this particular case to be misled? Yeah, I mean, it could be that, you know, there are local effects of NR or NMN on like the intestine that are really important. It could be that uh, their availability impacts the microbiome in important ways. The microbiome can have big effects on health. Uh, it could be that even though the amounts of like NR that may reach the liver or even lower amounts that may reach, you know, the heart or something are really small, that there's a subset of cells there that are really NR preferring because maybe they're really deficient in using nicotinamide and maybe getting even small amounts of NR to those cells uh, is meaningful. So I think these are all possibilities that we're you know, very much open to. Um, but you know, my base assumption is that often the obvious is true and here the obvious would be, you know, the physiological system just isn't that impacted by this particular type of oral supplement. Do you think there's any chance that with chronic administration, you'd see something different? Because I'm assuming in these experiments, you're not seeing the effect of these chemicals being ingested chronically, or are you? No, I, I think it could be. I mean, human can be different than mouse, okay? First of all, it's another important thing that I say. Yeah. Uh, we haven't done these experiments in human. Uh, I think someone, if they aren't already, should do these experiments in human. Uh, and um, yeah, chronic versus acute. So, so there's a bunch of variables that could alter things. Based on what you know now, if, if the hypothesis is true, if giving well, not, let's not talk about the route. If restoring intracellular NAD levels at 50 to the level they were at when you were 20 would improve some measure of performance, 
based on what you know today, what do you hypothesize would be the most efficient way to restore NAD levels? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, IV is the promising way to do the restoration. Um, I'm, I'm not very convinced about the first hypothesis. And, you know, I think the, the big history of medicine, you, you and I can debate it, is that things are way more complicated than people can envision, right? That, you know, hormone replacement therapy is like one of the great examples, right? It d didn't turn out to... Although it's being overturned. Well, but I think, you know, I think HRT is one that, I think if you go back and look at the Women's Health Initiative, um, I think it got it wrong, right? I mean, I think it was the randomized experiment, but it was really misinterpreted. So, right, is, 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 wait, 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 say a bit more about that. Maybe I picked up on the wrong thread of where you were going, but I assumed what you were going to say was, look, the epidemiology in the 80s and 90s was that giving women hormones post-menopause was a good thing. And then the Women's Health Initiative came along and said, no, it's a bad thing. I assume that's what you were going to yeah. say. And, and what I was going to say was actually, no, I think that's actually misleading. I think if you actually go back and look at the Women's Health, Health Initiative, um, it was just an awful example of how to misinterpret a study. Um, I think there was no increase in the risk of breast cancer. And if there was any risk increase in the risk of breast cancer, it probably had nothing to do with the estrogen that the women were given. Um, when you actually look, for example, at the relative risk and absolute risk different in those cohorts. So remember the Women's Health Initiative had three cohorts. You had your full placebos. Well, technically it was two parallels, right? So you had the placebo versus uh, estrogen only in women who did not have a uterus. And then you had um, placebo versus estrogen plus um, MPA, the synthetic progesterone. So in the estrogen only versus the placebo, there was a non-statistical significant reduction in the risk of breast cancer. So there was a hazard ratio of about 0.8 or 0.79 or 0.81, something like that. But it didn't quite reach statistical significance. But trending towards estrogen actually reduced the risk of breast cancer. In the estrogen plus MPA group, there was a barely statistical significant increase in the risk of breast cancer. I think the hazard ratio was, I want to say it was about 1.24, 1.25. Um, and the p-value was exactly 0.05 or 0.049 or something like that. So at the surface, you'd say, gosh, this is increasing the risk of breast cancer. And what was talked about was it was, it was a 25% increase in the risk of breast cancer. But the, you know, to talk about the relative risk increase without talking about the absolute risk is obviously irresponsible. If you look at the absolute risk change, it was 0.1%. It was one in a thousand. And that says nothing about a lot of other methodologic issues with the study, in, including the fact that, in my opinion, a more plausible hypothesis was that the MPA was more the issue than the estrogen. But the estrogen gets all the attention, right? So estrogen causes breast cancer, gets the attention. And, you know, if you look at subsequent studies, I don't think we see that to be the case. So, so I'm going to hypothesize or predict that in 10 years, I think that we'll look back at what happened to a generation of women, which I think is really unfair in that, a, you know, basically an entire generation of women got deprived of hormones um, because of, I think, a really poorly interpreted study. But your point notwithstanding, sometimes the obvious is not obvious. <laughs> Sorry for the digression. Well, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, but like, no, I mean, that, that was super interesting. And, and, and I thought there was some cardiovascular risk data in that study that was surprising, but I, I, it's, you know it much better than me. Yeah, I think on the cardiovascular front, there probably is a, a slight increase in risk with oral estrogen because of the hypercoagulability. Um, I also think it speaks to understanding the use case. Um, today, very few women on hormone replacement therapy are given oral estrogen. The preferred route of administration is is uh, is a is a patch, you know, something like a Vivelle dot, where you're given topical estradiol and you get all of the benefits of the reduction of vasomotor symptoms, the incredible benefits that you see on bone health, um, without any of the hypercoagulability and cardiovascular. So now we actually see the reverse. Now there's a very clear trend, uh, not just trend; it's statistically significant. There's a very clear reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Yeah, right, so that's a great example where. You had to give by the right route of administration, right, in, in order to get 
the net positive health benefit, right? And I, I mean, I, I think, you know, right, NSAIDs, Advil, an, another one, right? People knew they had a lot of side effects, but everybody assumed that they were kind of counterbalanced by the fact they were reducing coagulability and that this was going to be cardioprotective, right? And I, I don't know if you're going to tell me that you, you still believe that, but <laughs> no, I, I I don't, most, I don't, most people don't, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so, anyway. where, so, so really where you were going, I think is you were saying, look, you might even just reject the outright hypothesis, like this idea that, yeah, we do observe a 20%, 10 to 20% reduction in NAD levels as we age. You haven't even bought the first hypothesis, which is even if I could magically deliver 20% more NAD to a 50 year old, you're not, you're not sounding very convinced that that's going to improve quality or length of life. Yeah, not at this point in time, right? I mean, these, these things involve such complicated interplay of different organ systems. And it, it may turn out that, you know, NAD supplementation is super valuable medically. I am completely open to that, and I would love that to be the case. Um, but I think if so, it's going to be because there are select cell types that are genuinely severely NAD depleted and that we will need to figure out how to restore NAD in those cell types. And then we may see big health benefits. So I think that would be fantastic and it's completely possible. And it's possible um, that the general intravenous supplementation is hitting those cells and doing that. But I think it's equally possible that it's having some adverse effect that's gonna be net negative for people. And they, we, we don't know the science well enough and we certainly haven't done the clinical experiment well enough to give good health guidance yet. So two things. Uh, first, a statement. I, I, th I mean, this is really interesting for me because I, I really stand corrected and I just want to apologize to all the people over the years that I've said intravenous NAD is not getting in your cell. Uh, I stand corrected. It indirectly, based on everything you're saying, may actually be getting into at least some cells. The second is a question, right, which is how would you even begin to tackle that question, which is are there certain cell subtypes that may indeed benefit from NAD boosting? Um, I haven't really seen a single convincing clinical study in humans using either NR or NMN that has made me excited about this. And I'm not a stranger to putting things in my body without absolute perfect information, right? I mean, I take rapamycin. I've been taking rapamycin for four or five years. I will be the first to admit, I think we have very good evidence for that. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect. I'm, we're, we're never going to have a definitive human clinical trial. But if I'm willing to take rapamycin, why am I not taking NR and why am I not taking NMN? And the reason is I just can't find a shred of compelling evidence to tell me to do so. And I'm in the same boat you're in. I'd love it if there was, because it's a pretty easy, safe thing to take. So. What study needs to be done to help a, a, someone like me, a, a reluctant NADer, get on the NAD train? You know, I, I think we need to, first of all, map better the basic pharmacology of NAD uh, in animals and human. I mean, that, that's quite doable. And this is something that we as a field uh, are doing. And there are a lot of great people doing this, and, and, but we can do more. Uh, and better, then we need to have the technologies to look at this at cellular resolution rather than bulk resolution. So uh, this is something we're pushing very hard to develop the ability to take a slice of tissue and say, what's the heterogeneity across cells in NAD levels? And I think that'll be very helpful because if we see that that's really scattershot and aging and homogeneous and young, then you have your answer that, you know, all that we need is for one in 10 cells at any time to be really NAD depleted. And we view that 10% reduction, not as some tiny wiggle down, but as one in 10 cells being on the road to a catastrophic outcome, okay? And so um, I think this is gonna be a really important measurement. Uh, and I think the field will get there over the next you know, few years, uh, not instantly. And then ultimately we need successful clinical experiments, right? And I think there, there have been some really persuasive experiments in animals, you know, with uh, 
For example, I think there are experiments on reversing you know, bad outcomes after renal ischemia. Um, and so it'd be good if we could find niche experiments where there's a very strong effect in animals, a very quick clinical readout, right? You have a ischemic renal event and you do the supplementation and you get a benefit or you don't. So I don't think the how right was, way to go about How was it administered it. in that experiment? I don't think I remember uh, that one. You know, I, I may not get the details uh, of that right. So, um, but I think I would just say conceptually, we need to find the strongest yeah, animal yeah. proof of concept that can be translated into a small but definitive clinical trial and prove that this really can do something beneficial in the right context. And then from there, you can think about kind of, you know, expanding the indication to general health betterment. Who, who's the natural owner uh, funding wise of this uh, investigation? I mean, is, is NIH, is this a question NIH is interested in? I mean, indirectly through the ITP, Rich Miller, Randy Strong et al have, have already done an NR test. Uh, in in their very rigorous tried and true model, as you know, that failed, right? So NR did not extend life. Um, is NIH still interested in this question enough to continue funding it? Do you, you know, where where is your funding for this level of uh, investigation coming from? You know, we mainly try to help the real uh, NAD expert labs by you know doing the flux studies. Uh, facilitating measurements, but you know, it's not the bread and butter of my life. I'm probably about an observer at the same level as you of this, this field, broadly speaking. Um, I think you know, there's, there's money in NIH for interesting science, and so uh, this is too central to metabolism and too much public health interest for you know, so you're not worried. That, you're dry. not worried. This is not going to run up against it. No, and I think biotech is interested in this, and you know, there's very interesting ways to do this pharmacologically, and so we may see those mature faster. You know, CD38 inhibitors. Uh, obviously, there's a whole different financial structure there, right? If you can make a patent-approved, you know, medicine, and all that economic incentive is is great for driving. Um, first, you know, science answers and then clinical answers. What are the top labs right now in your mind in, in studying NAD and its, and its precursors or ways to increase it? Oh gosh, I, I think I'm too much of an outsider to get into naming names on that. I'm going to only get myself in trouble other than <laughs> okay. to cr credit, other than to credit in, you know, in, in Joe a, Bauer you're, you're, for being a fantastic collaborator. Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll, you'll, you'll fail to mention somebody. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, let's pivot to the final thing I want to really get into, Josh, which is cancer metabolism. It kind of ties in so, so much of what we've talked about. And that's how you and I reconnected five or six years mm -hmm. ago at a conference and then obviously a number of times since then. So, um, you know, the irony of it is, right, you do your PhD in the inner workings of how the immune system works, but you're not particularly interested in cancer at the time. You, 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 you come back to academia as a metabolomics experiment, uh, as, an, as a metabolomics expert, and now you've kind of wound your way back to oncology in a way. So um, tell me a little bit about that journey, right? How did you go from this profound interest in metabolism, metabolomics, and fluxomics to realizing a beautiful application for this is in the field of oncology? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Part of it is really the human connection, and uh, I was so fortunate to be at Princeton, which is this kind of academic bubble where I could do my experiments on E. coli and yeast and really um, set up these good metabolic measurements unmolested. But then, uh, you know, also we're close to Penn, and uh, at some point I got a call from the head of the Penn Cancer Center at that point in time, Craig Thompson, saying he wanted to visit. And it just, of course, I just say yes, you know, it's a, a simple one. And uh, that was kind of a life-changing call for me because it brought me into the world of biomedicine, you know, again, basically, in the context of working on cancer metabolism. And um, it was very natural because if you look at the history of cancer therapy, right, you know, the first great rational triumph in treating cancer was uh, antifolates and Sidney Farber, and you, you know, his name memorialized on the Dana-Farber Cancer Center, right? 
And so um, this is really the origins of how cancer was rationally treated <clears throat> by targeting metabolism. And it just got um, understudied for so many years. And it, it was a, a very natural re-entry point for me because cancer you can study as isolated cells. Uh, in a culture dish, much as we were studying E. coli and yeast. And so that was much more comfortable to me uh, in, you know, the uh, 2008 or whatever time frame than, you know, starting to work on mice. So I'm delighted that we got back to mice a few years after that. What year did Craig leave Penn to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering? Must have been shortly mm -hmm. after he invited you over, right? Yeah, a, a few years after, I, I think. So, yeah. And, so, so people like Craig, who I have not had on the podcast, but I'd love to, but Lou, who I have, um, you, you know, when you think about cancer metabolism today, I mean, it's just a booming field, right? I mean, I, I, I would argue, and no disrespect to people in different fields, but that cancer metabolism and, and immunotherapy are really two of the most promising and exciting areas in the field today, which were two things we didn't have a single word about in medical school, right? Yeah, that's uh, absolutely true, except you know, maybe some anti-metabolites for cancer hidden somewhere yes, in the yeah, pharmacology yeah, yeah. book, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but but um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the most exciting things is going to be the interface of those two fields also, and we see this with, you know, microbiome composition being predictive of whether immunotherapy works, uh, amazing work from Jennifer Wargo uh, showing that, you know, fiber can promote the effectiveness of immunotherapy. And so we're seeing that connection also. Soluble or made. insoluble? <laughs> yeah, TBD, okay? <laughs> so we're very excited to work on that answer. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, um, there are different flavors of soluble fiber. And so I have my pet dreams for how this may work mechanistically, but uh, I think it's gonna be an incredibly important interface. Wow. Um, so tell folks a little bit about um, what it is about cancer cells that makes their metabolism distinct from their uh, non-cancer counterparts, but within the same tissue even. Like if you wanna compare adenocarcinoma of the colon or breast or prostate and look at the perfectly normal non-cancer cell sitting right next to it. I mean, we, we typically talk about two hallmarks of cancer, right? We talk about the inability to respond to cell cycle signaling. So this is why these mm -hmm. silly things just keep growing even when they're told stop growing. And then the capacity to metastasize, to basically pick up, leave, go grow in a, no t grow, grow in a new site. Um, but what is it about them metabolically that also uh, is a piece of their signature? Well, cancers tend to be glucose users. And, you know, once you step back and think that, you know, in the fasted state in particular, using glucose is a, a, a weird thing rather than a default thing, okay? And that the, the default thing is to use fat and lactate, then the fact that cancer uses glucose is very distinctive. Um, and they do this in large part because they're programmed internally to basically feel like they're always seeing insulin. And this is through mutations in something called the PI3 kinase pathway that Lou Cantley, who you mentioned, you know, pioneered. And this leads to the fact they're positive on this FDG PET scan. So they'll constantly take up and phosphorylate and trap glucose or glucose analogs. And this is actually the most sensitive way to detect most types of cancer. Uh, downstream from this, though, there's a, a ton of metabolic changes in the cancer cells. Um, and, you know, the most fundamental of these is the fact that in order to do the uncontrolled growth, they have to do uncontrolled nucleic acid synthesis. And this is the vulnerability that was targeted initially by Farber, but has been targeted by a, a lot of very important medications that are, you know, widely used still today. You know, pemetrexed is first line treatment for lung cancer. And if you get these medications right, you can induce mutations through, uh, you know, the metabolic stress on the nucleotide system, and this can make immunotherapy work better. And so th that's a, a very exciting part. And I think that part has gotten understudied as cancer metabolism has, you know, returned to the fore. There's been a lot of focus on fuel usage cutoff, which is tough because like most cells in the body, cancer cells can use a lot of different types of fuels depending on what's available. Yeah, this is an important point, Josh, because a lot of people I think would hear the first part of what you're saying 
And their natural conclusion would be, well, wait a minute, if you know, you do a PET scan on somebody and it lights up with glucose, that tells me cancer loves glucose, ergo the way to treat cancer, don't eat glucose. The problem with that logic is no matter how little glucose you eat, you still have plenty of glucose in your circulation. I mean, even if you're in a complete state of starvation, again, going back to George Cahill, 40 days of starvation, they still had three millimole of glucose in their circulation 40 days out. So there is no way to eliminate glucose. Now, an argument could be, but you're going to minimize insulin. So I guess the question becomes, is minimizing insulin actually more important than minimizing glucose? But the, the idea of starving cancer seems potentially overly simplistic, right? Based on everything we've already talked about. Yeah, I, I think starving cancer is very, very hard. And as you say, getting circulating glucose to go meaningfully down below, you know, the healthy 89 where you last measured yourself is very, very difficult. And um, even if you could do that, it's not going to prevent the cancers from having access to internally stored fuel for a while in the form of glycogen, and then ultimately to amino acid fuel and fat fuel and lactate fuel, uh, ketone body fuel. And you know, we've shown very clearly that cancer can use all of those things. Okay? So they're, they're all valid inputs. They can't replace glucose in the test tube, um, but, you know, it's not easy to cut off the cancer fuel supply, um, especially not without cutting off some other critical fuel supply, the immune cell fuel supply, right, which would be a yep. disaster, or mm -hmm. the brain fuel supply, which would be an even more acute disaster. This idea that there's a way to exploit the metabolic, I don't want to say limitation, but I would just say quirk of cancer mm -hmm. in a way that also augments the immune system. Say a bit more about that because that's both fascinating intellectually, but also elegant in that it's mechanistically in line with a bias I have, which is cancer is really going to be hard to, you know, get under control. So, you know, hoping for a stalemate where you use multiple modes of action is probably a better strategy than hitting really hard on one lever. Again, it's a bias of mine, but, you know, it, at least I can acknowledge it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we're seeing a lot of moves to try to make cancer into a chronic disease where the therapies are not so uh, terrible. And, you know, certainly hitting the nucleic acid side of cancer is something people are trying for, you know, maintenance therapy. And I think we need to think about that whole side of cancer metabolism fresh because I think there are targets you know, waiting to be uh, developed. There, I think, you know, if they create nucleotide imbalances, which is a natural thing to do when you hit that system, then nucleotide imbalances are drivers of mutations, and mutations in cancer cells are drivers of immune response to cancer. So uh, that's one very appealing avenue. So in other words, inter interrupt their ability to synthesize DNA, they will create more mutations. More mutations is more shots on goal for the immune system. Exactly. So I think that's one really exciting avenue. Another exciting avenue is to apply a very strong stress to the cancer while putting pressure on their fuel supply. And so I think it's very hard to think that you're going to put so much pressure on the fuel supply, okay, that that alone is going to make the tumor uh, slow or even more optimistically regress or something. But if you come in with chemotherapy, for example, that's already targeted uh, preferentially, not perfectly, right, to the tumor. And then you pair that with something like ketogenic diet, which is lowering insulin, lowering glucose, then we at least see in animal models that this can be a very powerful combination. We see that the tumors uh, start to deplete glucose in response to the chemotherapy, whether that's because their vasculature is breaking down or whether that's because they have heightened glucose demand because they're having mitochondrial damage from the chemotherapy, I'm not sure. But we see that chemotherapy lowers glucose in the tumor intrinsically. And then if you come in with a diet that lowers glucose availability, this becomes stronger, right? And then you can get to really low tumor glucose and we see pretty big improvements in outcome in mouse experiments.
hopefully they'll translate to the clinic. We have a clinical trial open on this now. And what's the best tool we have besides the conventional, and maybe it is simply the conventional, in terms of ways to inter, uh, interfere with their nucleic acid synthesis, synthesis? Is it literally just going back to old school chemotherapeutics that do that? Well, for the moment, right, yes. I mean, for the moment, pemetrexid is probably the most successful clinical agent, but, you know, uh, gemcitabine and, uh, you know, other things of this sort are, you know, all well used as part of the armamentarium. But I think we need to think fresh. I mean, I'll say on, on this front, it's really interesting to me that when we were in medical school, you know, I, I thought we would not see a cure in our lifetimes for hepatitis. Yeah, and look at that okay. now, huh? And look at that, and that was mainly nucleoside analogs. I mean, we were told analogs. that. I mean, I remember being <laughs> told, like, there are two things that are absolutely, because I remember talking about this as, why can't there be a vaccine for hep C? And it's like, you, you'll never be able to vaccinate a flavivirus. Okay, well, that still turns out to be true, but you'll never cure hep C. And yeah, lo and behold. And this is just nucleoside analogs as the centerpiece of this, right? And so the fact that there's clearly untapped potential there. Now, maybe that potential was maxed out, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, when people were doing this hardcore for cancer from the cancer, but not hepatitis perspective. But, but my guess is that that's all chemistry that's evolved a lot. And mm -hmm. that this is a ripe area for, for rediscovery. Well, it's interesting you mentioned gemcitabine because of course that's, you know, one of the first line agents for pancreatic cancer. And if I, if I'm not mistaken, you have a particularly keen clinical interest in pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the cancer that I've worked on the most. Uh, it's obviously just a horrible disease. Um, you know, it's definitely one of the cancers that gives cancer a bad name. It's, um, it's the fourth leading cause of cancer death in both men and women. And yet by incidence, it's a fraction of that, right? It's, it just speaks to how lethal it is. Um, you know, the last time I looked, Josh, I would say that adenocarcinoma of the pancreas is 95% lethal. And I've heard people argue that the 5% who don't die are misdiagnosed, almost yeah, suggesting that it's pretty much impossible to survive pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is the worst thought in the world. Um, so you certainly picked a tough one to study. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel a very strong commitment to it because of a bunch of reasons. And, you know, but the, just the fact that it's so terrible is uh, a motivation. And I think it's, you know, was a disease that for a long time, people thought it's just so terrible, we just give up. And, you know, I, I don't think that's the right attitude for terrible diseases. And, you know, I think the one of the hardest things in making biomedical progress is getting a clinical readout. And, you know, um, the hidden positive and how terrible this disease is, is the clinical readout is just sitting there itching to be improved. And so uh, there's the capacity to do really compelling clinical tests of any idea. And it's a terrible disease. Most of these, uh, you know, clinical efforts are going to fail, but they can be done relatively fast, relatively cost effectively. And, and we're seeing progress. I mean, that's what's so exciting that, you know, fulfurinox is progress. A lot of patients' tumors respond. Even more will respond if you combine uh, two agents that were approved, a gem, cytobine, and a braxane, um, which is an albumin-bound form of paclitaxel. Uh, with a platinum agent. That triple combination uh, produces uh, regressions in most patients' tumors. Um, but they're so not durable. I mean, that's the thing killing us. The duration of response is terrible right now, but the fact there's response is promise, okay? And, and I think, in the anyway, the, normally from my perspective, once you can start seeing response, you're on the road. We have to figure out how to make the response durable. I hope that's where the metabolic part becomes important. It's going to be some interface of the metabolic part or the immune part, or uh, a yet harder hit with you know chemo or radiotherapy, earlier diagnosis. These are the hopes for for fixing this. Is there something about pancreatic adenocarcinoma that you've observed metabolically 
that is distinct from other gastrointestinal adenocarcinomas? I think, you know, colon is also a terrible disease. Liver is also a terrible disease. So all the gastrointestinal, you know, adenocarcinomas are unfortunately really bad diseases. But at least with those, stage one can be, I mean, certainly stage one colorectal cancer is survivable. Hepatocellular is a bit tougher, you know, you're, but you're better than a coin toss. But, you know, again, coming back to pancreatic, stage one is 80 to 85% not survivable. I've always wondered what is it about pancreatic adenocarcinoma that is so difficult? And is it simply that its rate of early metastasis is so early that stage one is just sort of a, a misnomer term? It's not, there's no such thing as stage one. I think that's is a, a big part of it. It's kind of a soft organ, the pancreas, and you get the, it's a very um, invasive cancer and you can have local invasion so many places from that site. Plus immediate in, in access the to the portal system that's just seeding it, the liver constantly. It's just seeding the liver. And so it's in an anatomically a really um, problematic location for keeping the cancer self-contained. So, um, I think the other thing is that, you know, metabolically, it's a very tricky cancer. It's almost solely driven by mutations of the RAS oncogene. Not saying there aren't other drivers, but almost every patient has this RAS driver. And this is an instruction manual for the cancer cells, um, not just to divide, but to do a bunch of metabolic things that involve scavenging nutrients from the environment and taking in nutrients in non-standard ways. And so it actually instructs the cancer cells to reach out arms, pull in nutrients, internalize them, uh, degrade macromolecule nutrients from the environment and use this as kind of a, a garbage recycling form of nutrient access that, that makes them very um, metabolically pernicious. The, the other thing that we see that's really interesting in new work in uh, mouse models of pancreatic cancer is that they don't have to be very metabolically active in order to be horribly lethal. So the pancreas is a master protein producing organ. And then you may think of insulin is the most famous protein to come out of the pancreas, right? But the bulk of the pancreas is not, yeah, you know, beta cells that make that, insulin. Right. It's yeah, exocrine that's only 5% pancreas. of it. Yeah, that's right. The exocrine is the real gland. And, and the exocrine pancreas is just making digestive enzymes like crazy. It does by far the fastest protein synthesis in the body. Mm. The cancer turns that protein synthesis way down. So it's not hypermetabolic. It's just that it, it has this huge capacity to make stuff that even when it turns it down, still has enough biosynthetic capacity to grow and divide and grow and divide because it's turned down its main energy consuming normal function of protein synthesis. It can function with much reduced TCA activity, reduced ATP synthesis rates. And so it's amazing so it's that it's very can be efficient then. Very, very efficient. So it, can turn down all these normal functions and it still has the capacity to reproduce the cells and make these horribly invasive and metastatic cells, which are ultimately lethal. Of all the epithelial cancers today for which we don't have a cure, which is almost every one of them, right? Shy of like a gist or something like that, or certain testicular cancers. Is there one that you're more optimistic about in terms of metabolic approaches to therapy? It's a great question. Um, I mean, you, you see pemetrexid being used effectively in lung cancer, right? And I think you see the cancers with mutational burdens um, being the ones where you're getting the good uh, immunotherapy responses. Um, whether they're ones that are particularly susceptible intrinsically to metabolic effects, I don't know. Um, I don't think that's gonna be the standalone heart of treating any of these cancers. I think it's more gonna be a key piece of the puzzle in getting enough either drug killing by preventing their metabolic escape mechanisms or enough immune activity. And those may be kind of um, opposites. <laughs> 
So you may need also kind of cyclic therapies where you go through rounds of metabolic suppression in order to um, keep things calm while you can, and then periods of metabolic augmentation that are really directed at augmenting the immune system. Mm. Uh, and and I'm, a, I'm a big believer that you know there's metabolic limitations on immune response to cancer, and that if we can overcome them, we will uh, have major therapeutic benefits. You know, you mentioned RAS in the context of pancreatic carcinoma. Um, RAS is rarely immunogenic in the pancreas, right? It's 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 a driver mutation, but the immune system it doesn't produce. Back to the way we started our discussion, it doesn't give us a beautiful little nine to eleven amino acid peptide. It gets presented <laughs> yeah. on an MHC class molecule, right? So it's yeah, the great but, irony of this whole thing. Yeah, you, you need more shots on goal. You need more antigens. Do you have any sense of how many tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are typically identified at all in resected pancreatic specimens? I, I think it's typically quite the um, lymphocyte desert. You know, mm. There's a ton of macrophage activity in pancreatic cancer. And so I think macrophage rewiring is going to be you know, a, a big part of um, allowing lymphocytes to enter. And these are areas where I think metabolism can be quite impactful. Well, Josh, this is a super interesting, I, I, don't, I hate that we're ending on somewhat a depressing note. Is there, <laughs> is, is there anything more optimistic that we want to talk about uh, than pancreatic adenocarcinoma beyond, you know, the statement that, hey, look, you know, this is why we have the smartest people working on the hardest problems, but um, anything else within cancer metabolism specifically that you think boy, 10 years from now, like I'm really optimistic that we're going to have a new way to, you know, hack into their um, DNA synthesis pathway in a corrupt manner that just spits out mutations um, using kind of novel systems, right? You know, I don't know, anti antisense oligonucleotides, like just something that totally disrupts them in a selective manner. You know, I, I think my big hope on this front is that we're going to be able to have some combination of uh, directed metabolic immune supplements and diet that really work with therapy to treat cancer. I mean, cancer is such a discrete disease. The clinical trials are so manageable. And the fact that things are metabolically messed up in the tumors so incredibly clear, and they're so clearly messed up in a way that's favoring the wrong kind of immune cells. And so ultimately, uh, through either some sort of supplement or diet, we're going to be able to reverse that and we're going to make immunotherapy work instead of for 10% of patients, for a majority of patients. So that's my uplifting thought for you is that metabolism will be part uh, along with, you know, uh, you know, better pure immunological therapies of getting immune control of cancer over the coming decade. And besides reducing insulin, which is such an obvious strategy, are there other metabolic levers to pull with the diet? Because really between ketogenic diets and cyclic fasting, those are kind of the two ways that you do that. Do you see evidence of amino acid restriction or any other nutrient restriction that could potentially play a role? Uh, I think amino acids are you know, complicated, but they hold uh, a lot of potential. I think the type of fat can be important. Um, you know, the, the saturated and unsaturated fat are, are really different, and in cancer, they're going to play you know different roles. So it's very nice work from Matt Vanderheiden's lab showing that you know a, a higher saturated fat ketogenic diet could be more tumor suppressive in some contexts because the tumors have trouble making unsaturated fat in the context of hypoxia. Say, say more about that. I wasn't aware of that. So Matt, I know Matt's work very well, of course. Is, uh, is he still at uh, Dana-Farber? Uh, he's at the Coke at MIT. So he's okay. actually head of the, the Coke now. Uh, okay. The, the and, and was this in prostate cancer? cancer? Institute. This was, oh, I forget what cancer background he did it in. I think it was in pancreatic, at least in part, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. So that's super interesting. So a ketogenic diet that was higher in saturated fat posed a greater problem for the cancer cells because they couldn't make presumably the essential unsaturated fats. Exactly. 
So I, I think this is a, a interesting strategy. I mean, those effects were relatively subtle up to now, but you know, it could, could be part of the picture. Um, you know, I, I think the really exciting part of the diet is also the parts that connect to the microbiome. So I think the fiber part, mm. really working that out. And maybe total protein matters in ways that we don't understand and needs to be uh, much like, you know, maybe we need to not just think about cycling, fasting, and feeding, but cycling, you know, for example, there's a time maybe when you want to come in with a lot of carbs in the absence of protein, and that may achieve something that creates a particular immune milieu. Uh, and then, you know, you need protein in the right timing after that. So there's a lot of things we can do with timing of macronutrients that can be interesting. And, and it seems like an eternity before we'd be ready to study this in a human clinical trial, because the permutations are so many. So do you feel like we have high throughput animal models where we can test these hypotheses and say, you know, hey, this is one way to do this. And, um, you know, or we, we've looked at 10 ways to do this in animals, but these are the three most promising. So we're going to kind of go ahead and do these now. Yeah, I think, you know, the good animal models of cancer are still not that high throughput. And there's a lot of challenges converting animal diet. Yeah. and human diet, right? And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll come out with some work showing that, you know, some of the most exciting dietary combinations um, are absolutely effective in animals, but they're not effective through the mechanisms that people thought before. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's because the, even in animals, trying to get the diets aligned so that you really isolate variables is tough. But I, I think the fact that we're asking these questions that haven't been asked before uh, is going to build momentum, and uh, we're going to we're going to build this interface out over the next five year period in animals, and uh, we'll do clinical work, you know, as a field in parallel with that, that um, has an impact and has an impact on patients' lives with, within the five to ten year timeline. I hope. Do you worry that the challenges of, even if you came up with the right diet, so let's just assume 10 years from now, the answer is a cyclic ketogenic diet that has this much saturated fat, this much monounsaturated fat, this much polyunsaturated fat, this much glucose on this day, this much protein on that day, like you, the, the formula exists, right? So this is almost an impossible thing, but that it's impossible to adhere to in the way that, you know, a pill or a drug or an infusion is much easier? Or do you think that in cancer, because the stakes are so high, adherence will be unlike it is in any other field of medicine? No, we have to make it simple, right? I mean, this has to be clinically um, actionable. And But, you know, I would go much more back to the first question that we asked, you asked maybe when I, I first mentioned the potential of immunotherapy and fiber, like, is it soluble fiber? Is it insoluble fiber? And then there really are different flavors of soluble fiber. Now, maybe it's the gamish of them, or maybe it's one in particular. Maybe it's one isolatable molecule that relates to that. And then we have one isolated molecule, tiny molecule, that will more than double the number of complete responses you get to immunotherapy in mice. One tiny molecule smaller than glucose, okay? You already uh, have that. We already have that as a, as a, as a metabolite, okay? And so I, I think we're going to get a, to So it could almost be simple, nutritional supplements as the, opposed the, the, to the, wholesale we, we, These can be sub, supplements. The dietary changes may be in a very acute way, just the way the patient comes in the hospital for a you know, tough bout of chemotherapy or a tough surgery. Maybe we're going to go to a place where we... Um, take people's glucose in the hospital almost down to zero for 12 hours, you know, with a, a deep ketosis and some pharmacotherapy at the time that we hit them really hard with chemo. And 24 hours of that, it's like light, night and day in terms of the overall effect. But it, it can't be asking patients to give up eating and giving up the joy of food. Yeah. Or another trial that we're, we're starting now is a trial uh, with SGLT2 inhibitor plus a low carbohydrate, but not fully ketogenic diet to see if it can put people in ketosis. 
And then just looking forward to, would this be a convenient way to get the benefits of ketosis in cancer patients while still allowing them to have a little bit of, you know, breaking bread with the family? Last question for you is totally random. I don't know what made me just think of this. Princeton is the only Ivy League school that doesn't have a medical school, correct? I think that's right. Is, is there, I mean, that there's got to be a deliberate reason for that. It has, it's, Princeton is fantastic in everything. Do you, do you know why it doesn't have a medical school? And um, is it just the proximity to Penn or that it was assumed that there were, that's where the collaborations would be? I mean, Princeton doesn't have a medical school because at its heart, Princeton is a hybrid of a college and a university. And it, it is an institution that, you know, has the ultimate priority on undergraduate education. Uh, it's um, committed to that. It's best in world in that. And uh, so I think um, in assessing how to be best in world at undergraduate education, the Princeton administration many times has asked the question, is having medicine on campus part of that? And the answer has always been no, let's have a somewhat more pure intellectual environment and keep our focus on doing the very best training for undergraduates. And so it's it, doesn't a very have a, it doesn't have a decision. business school either. And I guess it's the same argument, right? There's no business school. There's no law school. So uh, that's Princeton. Uh, it yeah. makes it very special. And it's good to have special places that are you know, distinct. I, I think that's a wonderful thing. Are, are you at all a fan of Richard Feynman's work? <laughs> At a very uh, light level, I guess I would say that's the best way to put it. But but it doesn't. There, there aren't places around Princeton that you go to see where you know he you know w what eating club he was in or things like that. You don't you don't uh, you don't look for the old places. You no, know, I, I I I'm not I'm not a, a fan that way. I guess they're. Um, I I read the giant biography of Oppenheimer and they're filming uh, the film of that on, on campus. So Matt Damon was apparently on campus. Uh, I, I'm guessing he's playing Oppenheimer, but I haven't checked anyway. So, but I guess I've become a small Oppenheimer fan after reading reading that intensive book. I have uh, three of Feynman's books, uh, meaning like books that were actually his. So I have uh, his Table of Integrals from when he was in high school. Uh, and then two more advanced calculus books, one from when he was at Princeton and then one from when he was his first professorship, uh, professorship at Cornell. Um, and that it's just, they're sacred to me, right? It's like his scribblings, like his notes all over these things signed Richard P. Feynman and like what, you know, what his address was and things like that. So, um, yeah, I've never, uh, I've never made the pilgrimage to, to look for his eating club and things like that. It probably doesn't even exist anymore, but I just wondered if you'd been the, been on the tour. No, but you, you should come down. There definitely have been some, uh, you know, awesome Princetonians, uh, you know, um, I, I guess my kids all went to nursery school in the building where von Neumann built the first computer. So, you know, there's, it, it is amazing mm, the beautiful. amount of stuff that happened around here. Well, Josh, so great to see you again. And uh, I hope it's not too long before I see you in person again, but uh, really appreciate, uh, uh, first of all, the amazing work that you've done over the past 20 plus years and, uh, and sitting down to, to share it with us today. Uh, it's been fun. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.